recording. Okay, we call the meeting uh, in order at 8.34. Recording pending. Well I don't saying recording pending. Yes. There we go. Welcome everybody to our second meeting <laughs> in a jam-packed small room. Uh, roll call. Um, Christy, what a roll call. Just yeah. make sure everybody's here and yeah, we're recorded. I'll just, uh, for the record, note all board members are in attendance, plus staff, Rob and Christine. Um, we don't have any other meeting ground rules to discuss unless anybody has anything they want to bring up. Yeah. Okay, that brings us to approval of the minutes. Uh, we have draft minutes that were circulated by Christine on Monday the 9th. Um, I'll take a motion to approve. Moved. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Then it's approved. I, I would like to note that to me it would be helpful if it wasn't by the minute, organized by the minutes or a, chrono a chronology, but rather a topic a subheader. This, this goes 1001, 1005, 1015. If you ever needed okay. to review minutes, it would be much easier if okay. there was subject matter that tracks with the agenda. Yeah, I'll, I'll see that. That would be great. Who's the, who's the minute? I'm, uh, I'm filling in for now, so I'm trying okay. to do Oh, dear. Okay, yeah. sorry, Chris. Let me get administrative assistance. We'll yeah, we'll I'll deal try. with it then. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with it then. I'm, I'm having a hard time just even keeping track of the times. I never got the minutes for some reason, so if we could check email distribution list, okay. that would be good. Um, we have to. We have, uh, we're asking people to wear masks in here. Uh, then we're going to ask you. Yeah, it's we have more. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on a second, Steve. Bibi uh. Otley. Yeah. A fresh one they last night. Yeah, good. Last night? Ah, uh, yes. There's another meeting engaged. Yesterday yeah, afternoon. So we're in here. Was it attached to the revised agenda or something? Uh, 252. Uh, I also want to make sure my email address. Um, Laura Sevilla at me? Uh, no, that just goes to my phone. Oh, uh, what's your email address? Uh, can you send it to my website address? Sure. Yeah. Would it be helpful yeah, if I pull the uh, Would it be helpful uh, if I pull the draft minutes up on the up on the screen? Yeah, oh, we, we already. Oh, yeah, we already. Yeah, okay. I think, no, we're good. I think, yeah, we're fine. Because okay. I think we're going to focus our discussion yeah. really here. Um, so the only other thing before we move into staffing discussion and presentation, um, we will add to a standing item on all agendas an executive session, just in case we need to go into executive session. Okay. But we can leave it open as, like, for. Some of the um, entities that I've worked for, you just have a standing executive session, no time certain. All right, sure. So, okay, who moved to support? I did. You, you motioned, okay, Holly motioned. Who seconded? I did, Dan. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's hard to participate and take notes at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> so what you're saying is a uh, possible executive session, just put that generally at the top of the agenda. I would put it last. Put it last, okay. So uh, it, like in our organization, we have a standing executive session at the top with oh, no time certain, but we don't go into it at the very beginning of the meeting. It just, it, it leaves notice that there potentially could be an executive session. Okay. And you can even put, um, you know, behind it to be determined or anything like that. So it's not a, People aren't feeling like there's going to be some private discussion happening. Okay. All right. So we can move on now to did, staffing. Did we get an approval of the agenda? Did I miss that. We didn't take action on the agenda. Okay. Shall we? All right. So let's let's take let's follow the agenda as you've laid out. Let's come back to the item one: agenda changes and request. Um, does anybody have any discussion on the agenda? I would like to propose that we do go into executive session on the staffing discussion. Yeah, we don't, they, from an organization design standpoint, we should probably do that publicly. I'm not talking about organization design issues when I'm thinking about this staffing issue, though. I didn't know that it was 
narrow to that point only as an agenda item? Yeah, I'm just saying, why don't we cross that bridge when we get there, when we get into point being, this is not, I don't expect this to be in, in, prior, in executive session. Neither do I. Yeah. So what we can do is if there are any personnel matters that are specific to a person or potentially could cause a concern in terms of a human resource related matter, we'll discuss if that subject warrants going to, into executive session, but if a general discussion, we'll keep it in open session. Right. And, and the thumb will be on the scale to keep everything in open session. And I'm contract just matters. letting you know that I would like to have the opportunity to consider going to an executive session in a staffing discussion today. Absolutely. Okay. okay. All right, going back to the minutes. I'm sorry, the agenda. We have a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Agenda passes. Okay, now we are into staffing discussions. Christine, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, so what I've done is uh, the first page of this is the staffing discussion. I'll take that sure take off that. I can share that for everybody else. There we go. So uh, I've been having, Rob and I have been having discussions. I've been having discussions with uh, June Tierney and her staff about uh, delineation of responsibilities. And what you're seeing by this uh, slide here is kind of a uh, assimilation of all the thoughts and ideas. So, you know, one of the things that we talked about, the, the um, I'm not sure where this comes from, but, but when it comes to grant administration, the, when I say administration, I'm referring to Scott's administration, they're taking full responsibility for ensuring that all grants in the state comply with the ARPA requirements. So there's a chain that kind of goes from federal requirements to state requirements through the DPS to us. So June's group, plans on continuing to take responsibility for the regulatory side of grant administration. I, I, you would have to explain what, what a regulatory side of grant administration means. I'm glad you asked that question, thank you. <laughs> that, and that, that gets into the real discussion is right. We are, there's a level of uh, discipline that, the administrator wants to ensure that these grants follow. So, and and in the and it maybe your works uh, since you were up write the bill. The position statement is that hey, we didn't want regulatory oversight. It wouldn't have been housed under the DPS. I don't believe that we're housed under the DPS except for the fact that we happen to share a facility that is allocated by the DPS. There is nothing about this group that is under the DPS. But this role, this role is part of the DPS, right? Uh, you are an employee of the DPS, but, at, but the governor appoints the executive director and then this board can decide to dismiss that executive director and hire another one. There is no oversight by the commissioner of this group, okay. this in particular person, I see no basis in the legislation to say that we are under the DPS. I don't know if you have some comments. I, I don't, but I, my, well, my question is in with regard to grant, uh, to the grant management and grant reporting. So what is the experience of the CUD? I don't think, I, I would say that. Well, so we made a decision. Oh, but, we, I guess we're determining that, right? Yeah, the experience of the CUDs, I think, yeah, is to sort through this. We have yeah. to pull this spaghetti pile apart. Yeah, yeah. Some noodles here. That's, that's, so that's your, my interest. Your question is, you know, I think, I think you've got a really good question there as well. There's a point. I don't think the CUDs, and I certainly won't say that I have, well, I could, 
we had a grant administrator at BBC. We did about $35 million in grants. And we'll so we had some experience. But the ARPA, you know, the ARPA requirements, now all grant requirements, you know, you, it's fairly straightforward. You analyze the grant, you do the reporting quarter, what the grant says, right? Um, I don't think the C, that all said, when you say how much experience, you know, it's a judgment call. I would say that the CUDs have limited experience. What, what would you say, Rob? The wrong question. I, I think I'm mis being misunderstood. Okay. So my point will be, and and what I'll, what, the place that I want to start from is, how do the CUDs experience experience this process? That's the place that I want to start from. So help me with that. I didn't understand. So, <clears throat> You know who are they? Who are they? Where's the application for the grant funding going to? I, you know, we make the determination, and then, but how is the communication going back and forth? And then my bias will be towards simplicity as well as account, good government and accountability. Well, maybe I, maybe it would be helpful if I give a, a what's happening now versus what we may be envisioning happening. There's still a lot of unanswered questions that we're seeking some clarification on. So what has been happening prior to the creation of the BCBB is that an RFP is issued um, by, the, by the state, by the department, uh, to all the different possible applicants. Uh, in the case of the pre-construction loans and pre-15, that was just communication union districts and their partners. Uh, they submit an application. That application is reviewed by staff, and a recommendation was made to the uh, director of telecom and the commissioner. Uh, then the grant was awarded, was announced. Uh, there's a whole other step after that in terms of developing the grant agreement, which we went through a process with the lawyers to make sure we had a strong grant agreement that took into account all the federal and state guidelines, the ARPA funds. They're challenging. There's a lot of different rules that have to be followed. Uh, that has been a challenge for, for me in explaining to the CUDs. That's not my official background in grant management. It's been a challenge for them understanding that. Uh, once the way the grant agreement is executed is it's routed, it was routed through the public service department, through the admin department, and then sent through, not SharePoint, uh, an, uh, one sign to the CUDs to sign off. And then the final signature came from the commissioner. Then they have to submit an invoice um, and any other steps in between within the grant agreement. So it, it is quite the process. What, what I'm still unclear about is what role the department is going to play in this new process going forward. A lot of those steps aren't optional. It may be a question of who's going to do what. Uh, when it comes to writing the grant agreement, for instance, that might be something that is a combination. When it comes to actually routing it through one span, that's something that's more technical in nature. What is one span? Uh, just to get the signatures. Uh, to entering all the data into the state grant tracking systems. That's something that yeah, that's that's something that's not where there is like qualitative changes being made or anything. It's getting things done, getting the signatures done, making sure everything is there that needs to be. Okay, but the person signing these grant agreements is Christine as executive director. That that is my that is my the, understanding. The group really? approving these. I, I'm just following legislation here. The group approving these grant agreements is this board. The form of document, which includes the ARPA, I've read the uh, grant agreement that went to NEK as a CUD. It's got all kinds of errors in it, but it does have uh, a section that distills ARPA requirements and you know list them so as long as you have that format approved for the boilerplate there isn't a lot i mean it's just like the the attorney general's office puts out a boilerplate of set of terms that has to go into the grant agreement you don't want to bother negotiating with that it's it's more pain than it's worth although it's a pretty direct problem for private enterprise to comply with some of those state requirements. Okay. One thing I have to put out there is uh, we are not, if it's attachment C, we are not, that is set by the state as a whole. That is not something that is set by, by DPS and that is a requirement. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, 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 these are boilerplate terms. 
So we don't need review of those on, for every grant agreement. We just need to comply with the set of terms. So I still ask you the question, what's the role of the DPS and what's regulatory review? Yeah, and that's why I think this is such an important deliberation because um, I, we're also going to be all all of the uh, CUDs and us will be required for a, a single audit, you know, for a public of a single audit. Uh, I've talked to, um, you know, I've, talk, I've, I've talked to uh, Doug Hopper's office, and you know, he plans on randomly auditing some of the CUDs over time, which I think it's all checks and balances. So the question becomes, you know, I really want to get a process flow diagram here. Not, we don't need to do that today, but that's our decision. Uh, the outcome should be, what's the process flow diagram? Does it stop here with our board or does it continue to flow to the DPS and then to the administration? For review, you mean, and approval? Yes. Yeah. Why would the legislature bother creating this organization? Yeah. The funds have to come from no, no, the funds are. The funds are here. The funds are at the department. Yes. Funds are at the department. So the fund has been established at the department. That's my way. Right yeah. Ago. But we allocate it. Yes. Yes. That's yes. Yeah. So to to the extent that the department needs to reconcile it, the fund balance sheet, because that keeps it connected to the state budgeting process. I see it. Right. I see that. But that it is an administrative check at best. When it comes to the content, I believe that stays with the board and at the board recommendations. But that is something where there may need to be some clarification or reiterating a board's position. I, I, you know, by whom? I think we just go with the way we interpret it, and if somebody wants to challenge us on it. That's great. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I think. Christine, this conversation makes me think we should have presentation done maybe by a lawyer regarding this. What are what is the role of the PSD in this this process? And I'm just looking at staffing wise. Are we planning to review every grant? Are we going to be doing, you know, yeah, I think that's why we're here. We're, yeah. we're digging in. What is the administrative support that we have? through the PSD, because I think we are going to need some. We are going to be, we're going to need help. Well, that's, that's why we're having I think that's why we're I know, I just, I, but it, as we start to build this, we start pulling apart the onion and we see the details of it. I think some legal guidance uh, going through the legislation would help. Yeah, so that's why you see in the DCB staff a legal component. You know, with that lawyer comes a question of, do we hire a full-time lawyer, which is, DPS is uh, interpretation, or do we contract for legal services? This is uh, this is why I was going to request executive session because I have an answer for you. Okay, okay. Unless it's a particular person, I'm going to suggest we stay in and it is. session. And it is contract negotiation as well. Okay. But I just want to have at least buy-in of the board, and then we can be public about what we were doing or not doing mm -hmm. so at this point we're talking about whether we need so, so i think that we're getting or... confused here though because the question on the table was to your point legislative interpretation mm -hmm. for my money we would invite maria royale who was of staff council during the creation of the bill in and we would ask questions and she would say well you know it was my direction to do this or i thought we let, drafted it so it would do that. You know, she could give us a real time feedback from both chambers, which is useful. Um, I agree. I think that would be really helpful to have the council come in and do that presentation. And we have a different discussion about our legal expertise and our staffing. Our staffing, exactly. That's a different discussion. Yeah, yeah. So focusing right now is what do we want the process to be for the grants? And what I'm, and, I, and what I'd like to do is bring that process flow diagram into a meeting for your approval yes. so that you know it, it puts your blessing on it to make sure we've interpreted correctly but what i hear you say is that the, you believe the role of the dps is really to reconcile the uh, 
the funds between uh, the grants that we approve and the ARPA funds. Is that what I hear? I think the count, the board asked to have ledge council. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll have ledge council come in and then we'll exactly. define the process law. We can all interpret it our, yep. in our own way, but I think it would be helpful to have that that grounding discussion. Okay, so we'll have uh, we'll bring ledge council in in future meeting. And is that? Yeah, I mean we're talking about three steps, right? We're I think the high level responsibilities are we need to gather together and make public all the grant funding opportunities there are, and there and that will change over time, hopefully, right? So make make that public in one place, make that publicly aware, and and what's available and 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 what we're what we're overseeing. The second step is what's the process that you want to that you can apply to gain access to those funds. Fully transparent. That's the process flow Christine is talking about, mm -hmm. and we're the administrators, or Christine's the administrator of that process flow. We're involved in the review of it. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is is after funds have been awarded, to be have transparency on what's been awarded, the content of the award, and then tracking the performance of the award against the reality on the ground, because that we have to reconcile those, because we're not going to waste money. Yep. That's a, I think that is a great summarization yep. of yep. what's our next right. steps. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's like my, my understanding is that it's like we deal with all that side of things, deciding what to approve. Yes. And in terms of getting the grant agreement out, getting the funds out. Yes. And accounting for those funds, that more stays with the department. So anything that's subjective is with us. Right. The thing, I mean. Ex I've, except for grant performance is not with the department. The grant de performance is not. No, okay. not I think is where we are looking at the having some grant in uh, finance and grant admin support within our mm -hmm. staff here as to be able to deal with that side of things in terms of uh, reviewing contracts, going through any contract review process, of accepting the reports, of, of being that point person. Uh, this, this comes down to where it's for the past few months I've been wearing about a thousand hats and I, I think I've been doing a darn good job, but there's yeah, a few yes. things that are not. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few things that are, are not where I'm the expert on and where they need dedicated support. Yeah, and this is so where that's we start where getting that help. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But in my experience, so I did this five years ago, I did this on the healthcare side where we were administer, administering healthcare innovation grant money. The biggest thing we're going to get challenged on is what is the criteria that you are judging That's the grant right. applications mm -hmm. against and are you being consistent and transparent in the application of that criteria on the awards on your decision making for the awards mm -hmm. that's that is where we got wrapped around the axle about a thousand times uh, because we never said we never we never had a nice clean black and white here's here are the criteria and everyone will be assessed on these so it was all in fighting and your favor you're favoring them versus us one thing that will be useful is later on in the agenda we are actually going through a, a draft a draft um, rfp for the pre-construction program the construction program is going to take a lot more discussion mm -hmm. but this will help you see of what's in an rfp um, and how we lay all that out and, and, and how you're interpreting the, the grant requirements yes yeah but that's an RFP you're issuing now. Yeah. That's not incoming grant applications for monies that we are responsible to distribute, no. right? No, this this would be, a, in, in state government, they seem to call that issuing an RFP. But it's issuing the grant, it's issuing the request for applications for the grant program. Okay. So, so that's where the so criteria so would be okay. listed and, and about determine like how we're going to judge those applications. Okay. Great, thanks. I, I do think that there's a policy decision that comes before all of that process of specific RFP requirements for pre-construction and construction, and that's to get straight some of our interpretation of our role as an aggregator, as a partnership facilitator, as the state plan administrator. Um, are there things that happen at, at the over, at the umbrella level that then sets up grant criteria? When you say umbrella level, oh, sorry. There, I mean, there are criteria in the legislation. There are, and I think we can't just slide right to the allocation of funds without considering some of those roles. So when you talk about the umbrella level, that would be this board? Yes. So since we're going to be speaking about later in the agenda, I feel like we may have moved away from the staffing discussion. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah what, so, so there's... <laughs> 
we really had some good debate around <laughs> some of the issues that we were struggling with. Um, I mean, I think the GIS professional has, there probably shouldn't be a debate there. That's not a technical application. Um, and I, and do you why, and I see this as a question when it says shared. I see this as a question of the best the best resource may not be an employee. Yeah, I think where we have examples of potential shared resources, that is something we will determine what is whether it's an employee, whether it's contract or otherwise. So just on the GIS one, I would recommend against hiring full time dedicated GIS professional, and I would strongly recommend we figure out how to leverage existing GIS talent, both at the state and the private sector, to get what we want. Yeah, the state, we're not, we're, we aren't going to get it from the state level. I've had a lot of deliberation on that because of the, the load that they have, but we certainly have some strong local resources. Yeah, but I, I just, I'm, yeah. Um, again, you, I'm going to make a prejudgment, and so I reserve the right to be wrong later, <laughs> but I'm not going to. It'll be a hard sell on me to hire a full-time GIS person to serve this board. That's and, and why? Well, it's not right, sort of flesh out your thought here we, before we move just, on. Just because there is that is a that is uh, Dan, stop, back me up on this one, buddy. The that is a, that is an available skill set that we have adjacent interest with, whether it's in the utility sector or some of the uh, other private companies that uh, you know. Um, you know, green energy companies. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of organizations that I know would love to collaborate with us yeah. on this and provide out of the box skill set, technology, and data that all aligns with what we're trying to do. This is this should not be a high high. high right. High. So just for clarity, though, um, the need for that function is there. We just don't need to hire it. I, I don't think we need to hire it per se because it exists uh, at a lot of different companies, and we just need to allocate the time. This. And so to get it, um, to, to get that resource and apply it, perhaps almost full time here, I think is important, but to hire it full time, th there's a lot of risk in doing that because there's tools set up and integration. Uh, it, uh, it's a vital, it's a vital skill set. Right. We agree. Vital and, function. Yeah. And, and we're not saying, just to put a cherry on top, we're not saying that we don't need a central repository and standard bearer for the data that this board uses. We do. Yes. You agree. Yes. And so it's really about getting an RFP. Okay. And Laura had a comment before. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, so I just want to confirm what I heard, which was there are no state GIS resources available for contracting for this board. No, not in the level that we need. Um, you know, if, if we are, what we're doing is we're providing this service to the CUDs. Each CUD needs to do analysis based on root design and all that. So they need. Instead of each COD hiring the GIS professional, yeah. we centralize it, right. make the data centralized. There is no state resources available to do that. In fact, the, uh, the, we had a strong discussion about keeping a firewall between the DPS data and, and our data because of much of the deep, much, some of the DPS data is uh, confidential. So they're trying to split that confidentiality makes it difficult. Um, we're going to have different applications for the use of this information. So we're really talking about carrier data, ISP data? Well, it's, that's a subset of the fact that, the, that what we're looking for is far more than what, it, right now there's a shared resource. And you should know that I've been doing this myself with the, with the CUDs. Um, in, you know, I certainly don't plan on doing it in this position, but it, it, there's a lot of work there in terms of GIS, and it's more work than the department can handle. That's the, that's the highest level issue. Yeah, and just backing that a little bit more, it's also there's, it's, we have it on, up here twice. One is for the GIS stuff that the board will be doing. We also wanted to have as a shared resource GIS tools and licenses for all the CUDs. That's one area where Every CUE doesn't need to be doing it. It's better to have a single place. So it's it's going to be quite the contract or a full time position. I know a previous to be CBD at working working for the department and very closely with their GIS person. Their GIS person wears about a thousand other hats too, yeah. and it's stretched to the limit and been incredibly helpful. But it's something where we need to have our own GIS resources and 
as soon as possible, frankly. So, the, so I'm glad you made that point, Rob. Really good point. I think we need to be very deliberate about separating. Are we looking at resources that are dedicated to serving the mission of, the, of this board uh, versus are we looking at resources to help supplement the competencies of the CUDs? Because those, they can be shared resource, but they're go they need to be chartered separately. So I would say on this top left, right, the way I read that, this is just my interpretation, my first impression of it. The DPS is responsible for the E911 database, right? Yeah. And that is good. And we said yet, yeah, we said last time we met, and if this has changed, please it, let me know. Yeah, it's, it's not, it, there's a separate E911 board and uh, BCGI no, 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 deals I'm, with I'm, that. But this, yeah, I'm just talking about, we, we said the available broadband availability data. Yeah, we okay. said the DPS is going to be the source of truth for that. We're going to rely on that. And that's, that's, we're not going to allow competing sources of truth to be developed, right? Correct. So that's what that GIS position or skill set needs to own. I think that's a DPS function, and that is something that the DPS in collaboration with this board have to make sure that we're, we have the resource and that they're chartered properly in addition to whatever else they're doing. You're looking at me funny. Uh, I'm just saying I, I, they don't have the resource to provide the additional support or even a lot of the support that I can be pretty demanding, and I've been pretty no, demanding on making sure I so get the how, support how that have they need. Kept, how have they kept the list of locations up to date so far? They have a GIS uh, person that does that as long as one of their other tasks. But as the board, there's going to be a lot of other GIS Not the stuff. stuff. Like no, the even, no, but even for us as the board. GIS because, you know, when you look at Off of that data? Off of, off of that data. Yeah, you'd have to take the data and then analyze it by, you know, by, in fact, you know, by, by broadband status, by CUD. Yeah, it's all in there. I see yeah, that data. Yeah, yeah but somebody's, to got, somebody's got to compile it. We're not going to ask the department to do that because well, the, sure. the, the department, department is the yeah. Well, Wait, all right, you can, like but you won't get your data on time because it, there's there's long delays between request and response, and I and I'm fine with that as long as you're fine with that. I I think we need to let me kind of unpack this real quick. <laughs> I think we're not talking about we don't want to do another data set of the broadband availability as we start having projects. We need the GIS skills to be able to evaluate those projects. That is where the GIS skills that's with our staff comes in. It, we're not talking about creating a whole new data set. We don't, we don't want to go there. It's like a, it's a months long process. The new GIS data, the new broadband availability data won't be available till October at the, at the soonest on the state level. We, that's not what we're going to take on. This is more for being able to take that data, take other data, synthesize it together so we can make good decisions and have that have that in in-house is what the proposal On project was. designs like or, or like routing or is that what you're talking about those types of things yeah and and, and for example that you know one of the things we're looking at you'll see later on the presentation is percentage of unserved by cud right yeah so i mean i can run that analysis on my qgis and linux database but i'd rather call someone and say can you give me this and have it within a half hour or so. Christine, you said something about, I believe everything here is going to be public record. You said something about um, some of this data might be uh, sensitive. Not, Not the data we're using. We're going to use all public data. Okay. We don't need it. I, I don't even want the sensitive data. I okay. want to be able to do everything here. Okay. Based on public data. I, I'd like you to tell us categorically, though, what the sensitive data you won't be using is. And that's so that's a debate I don't want to get into, but we can hire a lawyer for that one. But the, yeah. issue, the issue I'm told is that the including part of the, 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 the cable. So, I'm sorry. Yes. What's your estimate? No, I know there's one, one at a time. Go ahead, Holly. So I'm thinking that this is labeled staff, and your question is. Will we need professional GIS services? And I hear lots of on, yes. On staff. On staff. Well, I, I consider staff to be by contract. Okay, great. Oh, great. Yeah, we do too. Okay. Yeah, or by employee. Okay, but great. you know, but if you want us to vote right now, whether it's an employer or a contractor, okay. But there's also a conversation that's inherent in what's going on that's about um, the topic at 11:30 baseline data presentation. Because we're really talking about what your baseline data will be, where it comes from, who houses it, and how we get it. I, th I think we've been jumping around a lot on different things, and we're going to touch on all this later. Um, I also do know, looking at the agenda, 
I know at 930, we're going to have updates from the CUDs. And I know one of them, DB Fiber, has a very short period of time and would need to present first. So I don't know how, oh, so you know, I, how we, we want to switch things. We, we've we invited them things. to give us direct input. To give us direct input on pre-construction and where they're at based on that. Let me just uh, say, look, I think we can summarize this. I think we're in agreement that we need GIS resources. Is that correct? Yeah, we need we need a GIS capacity. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And see, so, I, I and mean, I look at GIS data maybe a little differently. I'm looking at GIS data in terms of pole counts. This is different than your GIS data sounds more like 911 addresses. Well, it's also we, we need a combination of. It includes, it's all, it's all, it's all okay. design. It's all you know, you get down to the design is going to be hub locations. It's going to be splitter locations. Right, but it's the 911 data locations. set is not going to have. There's a utility pole located. Oh, that's this why, site. Yeah, that's why we need we're going to supplement system. address data with what we know about internet at that address with electric infrastructure because we need that mm -hmm. information to string fiber from point A to point B right. to get to the members. Yeah. House. There, there's another reason just to support your logic there. The definition of units of personal service will be driven by the electric distribution system. Exactly. So exactly. it's E911 plus electric. And it should also be driven by existing assets. So that should be part of the data set. So I, I can tell you 100%. So VEC and GMP both have all of that data in one place. They have the E911 locations by service type or by speed. Uh, all the, of course, all the electric assets are there. Um, the telecom assets are not in there. They exist so you couldn't do a hub thing. But, right. but if that's available, it can be added. Um, and so, you know, in those service territories, you're able to get exactly what you want. It was supposed to be added to that was what are the CUD service territories within all of those electric territories? You can see the overlap. And right, but this goes to support Christine's comment about this is not where Christine is going to sit there and crunch data right. on. We need to outsource this or capacity within our system that we can build up this infrastructure yeah. of GIS data. And I, and I think so it's beneficial and useful to see very close to existing already. We have a discussion on some of the data later on. I'm happy to show you all the different layers and of, of what there. I think this is more about the act of synthesizing data wherever the data comes right. from yeah. that we that we need to support okay. when it comes to staffing. So cool. after we talk about baseline, maybe we come back to this. Okay, exactly. I think the I think baseline, we need to deal with the baseline ASAP because that helps drive the rest of the decision making. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, if we could switch before we leave this topic, I also want to say that I would like to make Rob the deputy director uh, in terms of this organization. We work hand in hand and certainly, you know, we'll divide up our responsibilities between each other. But, and that's when we can have, you know, if you want to have that in executive session, that can, we can. Is there a direct, I apologize, I, have, I do not have the X71 memorized yet. <laughs> Is there a space for a deputy director? Lot of space. Yeah. Staff. Okay. Yes. It's wide open. Okay. It's up to us. Yeah. It's up to us. Okay. It, that seems like appropriate for executive session. Yeah. <laughs> not that I, I'm, I'm not expressing an, an opinion against it. I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. I think the position of executive director is in public session. If we appoint Rob, that's, that's a staffing issue. I don't. That's yeah. a separate. Yeah, we can yeah. talk about the deputy director role generally in public session. Yeah. If exactly. We're talk about Rob in that role. We should go to executive session. Agree. Or that's delegated to I'm, Christine to appoint. You deal with it. Yeah. We appoint the position. You deal with hiring. Right. So, so the so are you trying? So I'm a little confused. Are you? Is your approach here to get to the point of publishing an org chart? Well, that's. Not to happen. It doesn't need to happen today. Right, right. Well, and, and that's really yeah. you brought it up as a as a position. So, are you asking that the board vote on that today? I don't think we're prepared to do that, Christine. No, this is a no, little I, bit no, jerky jerky right yeah, now. Yeah, maybe. there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. I'm not saying that we won't have an executive. No, I was requesting approval. Okay, we're presenting presenting this for deliberation. That's what all these things we can decide when we want. To approve these things. Okay, Laura. So I would love to see a high level job description. I mean, not okay. in the weeds, but what are the responsibilities? 
because, for instance, I think about if you're hiring from within, there are some key roles here. So I want to make sure that the activities, um, you know, if you end up hiring somebody from within, those key roles were identified or that we knew we were going to have to replace, for instance, if you were to bring in somebody like a Rob. You know, do Rob's current activities <laughs> continue or do we bring in someone behind? So, again, I don't need like a, what are the responsibilities that you envision? Again, we need a high, we need a presentation of the staffing and what exactly, what this position would do and there's Rob's position now, yeah. that, you know, what is that happens with Rob's position? We just need an overall umbrella picture of what is this, what are the staffing needs? What are you proposing for staffing needs? And what's well, our think, budget think, also for staffing? I think that's what I'm showing here is the overall umbrella. What I'm hearing is you'd like a specific job description for the deputy director. So or would I, you like job descriptions for each? I would, we, we, we see, I'm not ready to deal with this because I don't think I'm we're talking about this. So I don't think, think we're talking you, about this. I'm we need to agree, but there's some baseline stuff. We need to come up the learning curve together. And then very quickly thereafter, this is we're going to hit this. So okay. completely we, appreciate that. But I want an action. Do I have an action item coming out of this discussion? Sure. And just be clear what it is. Less than one page, right? Yeah. No, I'm looking for bullet points. So I am not looking for you know, a two page, three page. Not the HR. The, the action yeah. item I have is coming out of this discussion. discussion. The action item is to develop a high level job description. For each of the positions that you and capacities that you would like us to bring in, okay. just so that we understand how the pieces come together. Does that make sense, Pat? Yes, and I'd also like a budget how this is funded. So we've we've got a pot of money. Thank you. Yeah, we also have to assign dollars to this. Okay. And it's gonna be difficult to have that discussion without that that process yeah. document Christine is gonna develop, which is you know, what is our process to take the funds that we're responsible for, make them Make them make people aware that they're available. Take in the grant applications and then award and track the performance. Right? I mean that that's the work. This is the staffing to yeah. do that work. So those two have to kind of go hand in exactly. hand. Exactly. Exactly. I will now make a comment about legal. Okay. <laughs> in open session. Okay. Now let me also ask you another question. Um, <laughs> no, Christine no. probably has the floor. Oh, sorry. So um, I've heard from the people at the department about legal services. I've spoken with you a little bit, Christine. I've talked to some um, very experienced counsel in the outside world. My um, best, best advice to this board and to you, Christine, is that we have an, a, 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 a type of a general counsel that advises the board and advises um, the staff on grant documents, on open meeting laws, on various kinds of compliance, right? In terms of paper production, it could be the case that that general counsel is able to source that as required. And that's if we take a, a law firm and make a contract with somebody to provide those legal services. Yes, I have somebody in mind. It's also practical to um, house a person that does grant administration and documentation in-house that is supporting that function. Mm -hmm. I don't see it as part of a finance um, uh, job description, just so you just no, so we have legal and finance. Dra drafting grant agreements under finance does not compute. Uh, very definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so um, that uh, that's just a, a generic way of saying there's more than one way to, to skin the cat. And I think outsourcing um, high level advice, even if it's daily advice, can be accomplished. I will just say coming from an entity in my real world experience, um, that does a lot of granting. We have a grants and finance person who have that work reviewed legally as a, so the, it, grants, the grants are not developed there. 
which is to say, I think we have options. We have options. <laughs> and part of it is the fact that we might start with, a, if we're worried about the grant documentation, right. we're going to start with a lot of that in a format that's been used here. Right. So. Okay, before we leave this gap discussion, are we done with legal questions? For, for now. Yeah. The, 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 the administ hiring the administrative assistant has already, the process has already begun. It actually began before I even came on because the recognition of the need was there. The question for the board is, shall I halt that process until we come to an agreement on the staffing and budget and, and make and Get and the administrative assistant is going to do well. How does it fit into the work to be done? And... Okay, so so <clears throat> uh, it's a whole level of supporting this board that yeah. is administrative. Yeah. So all right. So the question I have for the board is: Shall I halt that process? Uh, so but I'm, I'm just. This is. I'm just going to jump in. Then around the room let's do it that way i'm not suggesting we halt the process i think there's a clear need for help here just i think it would be it'd be some flesh on the bones what that person would do initially in their first month what are they doing what is the administrative assistant doing in addition to supporting us they are doing xyz okay that's my question i don't know if you're prepared to answer not that, ask that I mean. okay if, for me, actually, I think if we had an understanding, if I had an understanding of the flow of how the expect all of this, this, what's the process that we're going to use, and then we can start staffing. These are the people we need to make this process work. If we agree on the process, then we can find the resources to make the process work. I would prefer to do that. And I agree that we need a lot of this. I just don't know to what extent. And permanency or contract, all that. So a process would be the best way to start in my mind. And then we staff the process according. So this administrative person may have multiple duties if we knew what the process was. And, and, and maybe that's the best place to start. I don't know what for that. Thank you, Drew, with that. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I, I, I would like to have that kind of administrative capacity continue moving, but I, I agree. I mean, I think we have to have some sense of, and also some understanding that we're building something from scratch and and quickly. Is there <laughs> a, sure is there, is there a, is somebody, is there a higher imminent? Like, how, where are we in the process of this? Job description that was? No, but is there, is there like somebody yeah. about to be made an offer or? Well, no, 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 the question is, process, I discovered the process was starting. I discovered this yesterday. So, but okay. So, question it becomes that's exactly why I'm asking the question. It's like, all right. So, I, so some of this, you know, the legal process started. I held up that two weeks ago. But the administrative process started. I can hold that as well. Who's starting these processes? The DPS? The DPS, yeah. I think in the, in the legislation, it that does was say supposed that. to be a transition that. The idea was to get the board up and running and have some support when it when it started. Uh, the, the way the time frame worked out, that that didn't happen. Okay. I think with the administrative assistant, I think within the classified system, there's set job descriptions for it, okay. and then you could put within that what those job responsibilities okay. are. So I, sorry, I know we were going around the board. Yeah, so let's go around the board. <laughs> this, this is helpful, Rob. We'll come back to you, but let's go, Brian. I agree with what Dan said. Ideally. Um, if we can't have perfect clarity on process to then fit the team and the roles into it, if the timing doesn't work for that, then it's, you know, I'm less worried about an administrative support because it will benefit all of us. Um, but I think I just, you're going to hear a recurring theme from me, you know, all the state work I've done, um, especially around grant administration, you know, there, I have always been unimpressed with the sanctity of the value of the dollar. And so I'm going to be beating the drum of let's not waste money and let's not spend money unthoughtfully. So um, this one probably doesn't make that radar, but that's the lens that I always look at stuff through. Um, I agree with what's being said about process first, comma, and uh, while the legislation provided for the DPS to make inquiries into legal hires and administrative support, 
it wasn't clear that it was in, uh, implied, I believe, in the legislation, that that was to get ready for this board to come together and begin to act. We're here now. They should stop whatever they're doing. We should take it on. We should hire our own people. We should do our own work. And they didn't get it done before we got here. So that's fine. Let's do it. One other point of information, this is clarification that we need to get from PSD, is another part of the legislation provides PSD with additional funds to be able to cover the administrative support. This administrative assistant that they may be hiring uh, from the little that I've heard so far would be with them. We need an additional administrative assistant here to support the board, to support Christine and I, uh, to go down and let people in and answer the phone and, and not be the auto warranty people. They didn't want to join our meeting. That's <laughs> why I left. Uh, like there's a lot of just um, that basic level as well as preparing the board for each meeting. I think for, since Friday, Christine and I and I have worked nonstop to just try to get ready for, for this meeting. It's not always going to be like this, but there's a lot to be done in order to keep all of us informed. I'm going to ask, can I ask one question before you jump in? With this, Christine, do you envision, like if you were to hire somebody today, exactly how Rob described it, we've got a bunch of like on the ground work that needs to be done, setting up Zoom meetings, um, preparing packets, getting material out, and getting that to start spinning smoothly. Finding a place to file the minutes. Like, exactly. <laughs> Finding a um, bigger room. <laughs> getting us set up with emails. I wouldn't want the two of you doing that. Somebody well, else should be doing hours. it. Two, three hours I, each Friday just Meeting management a is a time yeah. sink. Yeah. But once that person gets up and running, is it, it would it be envisioned they're doing other things after that? So who you hire is not just an administrative assistant, but can can grow into other capacities. And I don't know if we have that that uh, capability to, to have that type of person come on board. Mm -hmm. State employees tend to be very boxy. This is It's not in my job description, I'm not gonna do it. I don't wanna hire Maybe that skills, person. That'd be great. No. <laughs> yeah, well, no. Can I comment on that, Patty? Yeah. I, I don't think that there's, um, we'll get this setting up stuff done and then that goes away. It's going the there's, there's total it, management, but it, there's going to be yeah. a continuing need of basic administration or baseline administration. It could be the case that somebody who's doing administrative work helps log in grant responses and tracks deadlines on mm -hmm. grant responses and RFPs and does some of that process work um, in addition to board administration and other administration. But you know. I don't think it goes away. I, th I don't think it goes away, but instead of six hours, it's an hour. Eventually it gets into your you're humming along. You no longer have to set up emails, the emails are done. Zoom, once you have a Zoom account set up and whatever, you, that's done and then it's just, it's quick management. The, the time sink shrinks. Yeah. And then that person needs to evolve into other things. So whoever we hire, it needs to be set up such that it grows into other things. Like you said, database management. Um, assistance with GIS. Mm -hmm. It's a to me the administrative assistant should be a broader than just paper shuffle. Fielding calls for all the CUDs and what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean right now that's Rob as right. in, as intended. As in, as intended. Right. <laughs> that's, that's a thousand balls. That's, uh, but that's right, something right. that we can try to dis discuss later on yeah. about them as we're reorganizing some of these things. There's also like just the basics of posting minutes, updating the website. Which is like, not I'm trying to do all of this That's right now right. and everything else. Yeah, <laughs> which it's is a lot. A challenge for, for myself personally and a challenge for the board and, the, and this effort. So this is really a support person for Christine and I that should be a Jack or Jill or whatever of all, of all trades to some extent. So the reason I ask these questions is personally, I would be fine moving ahead with an administrative assistant with that higher knowing their job is going to evolve. It's not a, here's my box, I'm gonna stay in these four corners. I don't need to have the whole objectives, everything plainly laid out and mapped out because I know we need this immediately right now that I don't finish with that. Okay. I'm, also, I'm also fine with that, but I wanna go back to Rob's point, make sure that, or something he had said earlier, make sure we're all clear 
I think you were talking about two administrative assistants a few minutes ago. Yes, I was talking about, I think, I believe the department is hiring one to deal with what they expect is the additional load that they're going to, whether it's processing grant, uh, payments or the running them through one span or those types of things. And that we might need some clarification. But then there's another role that is supporting you all, the board, and then supporting Christine and I. And, and so, so Patty, it would be great, I think, for us to have a sense of what that person will do for the PSD in the future, if we could get some just some knowledge about what that mm -hmm. support role will be. And then I want to be clear that what you were asking us, should I continue, was the support person for you involved. Yeah, yes, and, no, the, board. and the board. And the board. And the board. Excuse me. Except yes. one thing, yes, I, that's what I was talking about. And I and I and this discussion reveals that I will get more clarification, you know, whether whether you ask me or not, it's clear I need more clarification on who they plan on hiring and what the role is, mm -hmm. because it's going to be billed to us. Right. Right. And where that fits in the process. Yes. Well, and it, and, we and I do recall sorry. this. From the commissioner, I have the legislation up right now. Good. I'm looking to see it. Good, because I, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering. I, to me, it seemed like the administration reference was, you have administrative capacity because you won't be doing the same things you were doing. So please share with the nascent board until they're set up. That's how I heard it. Not go hire a new person. That's confusing, though. Well, so if we're going to have two admin people, we... Yeah. So one's for the PSD. So why waste for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. For good reason. I guess it's a larger question of what we want to take on. Like, do, do Is that a question for Ledge Council? Or are, are, can, can, we, can, we just, can we tell the department what their administrative support responsibilities will be in collaboration with what we are expecting the staff ourselves so that there's a definition that we make they can respond to and it's coordinated. Let's do that. Laura, can we do that? I mean, I think we certainly can try. I mean, I know the commissioner, I'm sure the commissioner will have an opinion. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that, that now we're just having a productive conversation. Let's right. beg forgiveness, not our permission. Um, yes. I agree with you. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll take an action name out of this. We're going to subscribe. What we need from an administrative assistant. I'm going to share that with the department. I think it's it's we're going to describe what we need from an administrative support standpoint between right. the department and the board. Right. And then we'll look at those responsibilities, where where which responsibilities sit on which side, and then think about how do we now get the people to provide that yep. or person to provide that. Yep. Okay. And, and maybe we're yeah. sharing the same person. Yes. Exactly. It may be two half position, 0.5 FTEs. Perfect. Right. And the goal here is to A, be effective. We know we need administrative support right now. We, that's like, that's clear. We need to be effective. We need to be cost accountable. Right. So if we all of a sudden have two administrative assistants, that begs the question of, it makes us pause. It just, it complicates this. It makes me pause. So there was a certain amount of funds appropriated to the department to support this effort that's separate from the funds that were given to us mm -hmm. in order to staff up and to build the board. But those funds will be built back up to the board, correct? Yes. And yeah. So let's just use those funds all together yeah, right. to make the right solution. Exactly. Okay. And to your point earlier, Patty, it should be a growth position. They should. They'll start with some blocking and tackling, but ideally there'll be some growth opportunities and skill development for the, exactly. right, for the right individual. Right. Like and you. we want flexibility to manage that versus yes. having it in a box, square box, they can't get out of that box. It's not yeah. my job script, you can't do that. I don't want to deal with that. Thank you. <laughs> we want Rob clones. <laughs> well, yes. We can talk about that stuff. <laughs> I don't know if we have that technology yet. So. <laughs> I think, so I feel like you've given me adequate directions. Okay. Oh, All right. Do we need to talk? Do we need to talk about staffing more in an executive session and want to add that? I was, wouldn't be adding it to. It would be extending this elsewhere in the agenda and okay. move on to hearing about the pre-construction. So we do have some guests. I would suggest for now we park the staffing and come back to it. See if we need it to address any more. But we have a time certain 9:30. So let's do yeah, that up. Is, okay. And then if need be, we can come back to staffing. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop presenting now. 
And I'm gonna make sure, sorry to talk to myself through this, everybody. Um, so I am going to make uh, David Jones a presenter. He is with uh, Deerfield Valley CUD. David, are you there? David, how do you? Do we see David? I see DJ. I see DJ. Yes, I'm here, Rob. Sorry, uh, uh, moving between screens. No worries. Uh, so this was this was added to the agenda just to get an idea of there's been a general need to better understand where the CUDs are at, to understand the pre-construction needs, understand where things are going. Uh, so that's why uh, several different CUDs um, are going to provide a, a few minutes of that and be open for, for questions. Uh, so I'll start with, uh, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself and share your screen for your slide? Uh, I, uh, I will try to share my screen. I am not Wait, let's see how I do that. Uh, I can see if I can pull it up as well. Is it, uh, screen share. Okay, got that. Right next to the yeah. leave button. There you go. Maybe. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, I don't, uh, we don't see it yet. Let's it might be how uh, Let's see. Oh, here we go. Which CD is David from? Deerfield. 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 Thank you. Okay, uh, Rob, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to share my screen. Uh, okay, let me open it. You did share this with me this morning, so let me, let me, um, I'll put it on mine and share share mine. It's just one slide, so. Okay, well, um, while Rob's working on that, I'll I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm David Jones. Uh, I uh, am the vendor committee chair uh, of the Deerfield Valley Communications Union District which is primarily in Wyndham County, plus uh, several towns in Bennington County and one in Windsor. Uh, our chair, Ann Manwaring, and our vice chair, uh, uh, Stephen John, uh, are unable to attend today, and so I am representing TV Fiber. Uh, my goal in the three minutes uh, that I have is to uh, describe uh, uh, succinctly uh, what we have been up to for the last uh, year and a half, uh, and uh, where we're going, uh, hopefully, with uh, the uh, board's help. Uh, uh, after uh, one year of organizing, research, uh, planning, uh, we ran an RFP process to select our private sector partner or partners. And then after uh, several months of uh, uh, review and discussion with the leading candidates, we selected uh, Great Works Internet, uh, of Biddeford, Maine, GWI. Um, we're working with GWI to prepare an engineering and pre-construction contract that we intend to have ready for signature when we uh, have a pre-construction uh, grant agreement. Our, our key goal is to have a full season of construction next year, which requires that we make substantial progress on the pre-construction tasks this year. And those tasks include completing a high-level design for all 24 towns, completing uh, utility poll surveys in the remaining uh, phase one towns. We completed uh, four uh, in part with help from our uh, CARES Act grant last year. Uh, we need to complete the detailed engineering for the construction to be done uh, in 2022. That would be a subset of towns. We'll need to iterate our financial plan based on the findings from the design and engineering process. Uh, planning is iterative, as I think you all know. Um, we will need to then prepare the RFPs for the uh, construction uh, uh, subcontractors. Um, we uh, uh, understand that there has been a discussion of whether uh, pre-construction grants should not be awarded until there is a comprehensive statewide design of some kind. And as a practical matter, uh, 
uh, the way we see it, the time required to develop a uh, comprehensive statewide plan would consume at least months and would set us back as much of the year if we're not able to uh, accomplish substantial uh, utility make ready this year as the result of the, uh, of the, of the planning uh, uh, and, uh, and poll applications. Um, so our, our recommendation uh, is, uh, and our hope, is that the board will focus statewide design efforts on middle mile connections between uh, the major carrier interconnection points and uh, uh, CUD networks. Uh, CUD islands, that is uh, uh, sections of CUDs that are separated by wide expanses uh, 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 and, uh, and electric utility fiber. All of these uh, are uh, uh, fi fiber assets uh, to be owned and constructed or are owned and have been constructed by municipalities and regulated utilities. Um, our immediate next step is to clarify the pre-construction grant RFP requirements and process so that uh, we can be ready uh, when the uh, process is open uh, so that we can uh, uh, bring our contract uh, uh, to you and our proposal uh, and hopefully uh, uh, get, get the funding we need to begin work. Thank you, David. And this is a question on the board. Do we want to do questions now after each one, or do we want to do questions at the end? Yes, let's do individual. Okay. Um, hi, David. Thank you for that overview. I'm wondering if you know how many locations in your district need to be served in your planning process. Right. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, approximately 8,000 uh, uh, underserved uh, or unserved addresses uh, in our 24 towns, uh, uh, and we have roughly 800 miles of fiber, I mean, 800 miles of, of what we anticipate to be uh, fiber routes. Thank you. We will, we will know this uh, uh, when we go, and, and those numbers come from uh, our ability to use uh, Department of Public Service uh, public data uh, and to uh, do some uh, GIS work on our own. We are going to be uh, reviewing all of our numbers uh, in the pre-construction uh, 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 process uh, in, in the high-level design and the detailed engineering plans so that um, we have a, uh, uh, the very clear picture of uh, what we're building to. And David, just to clarify that the number you gave of unserved addresses, is that the base 2019 data or does that account for wired addresses served by the connectivity initiative addresses uh, that are going to be funded through the FCC RDOF program? I just want to just make sure we're talking about the, the same numbers. So we're going to talk about numbers later in the presentation, later in the meeting as well. Right. Um Rob, uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't have a cheat sheet of numbers in front of me, and my memory uh, is such that uh, uh, I, I gave you numbers off the top of my head and would not trust them. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I can, uh, uh, I can provide those numbers uh, uh, in an email uh, 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 in the course of the meeting or after. We have done substantial work to uh, uh, study the DPS numbers uh, 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 to study the mileage of our area. Uh, and those uh, that, that work has been the basis for our original business plan when we had 15 towns. Uh, uh, our uh, internal financial models uh, uh, when we were making decisions about uh, 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 which vendors to hire. Uh, uh, and uh, and will and will be you know uh, constantly part of our decision process. David, this is Patty Richards. Thank you for joining us today. Um, just wanted to uh, dig a little bit into the 800 miles. Is is that 800 represent backbone, middle mile, and to the house? Can you describe the 800 miles in a little bit more granularity? Right. Um, when you look at our district, there's really uh, two sets of, uh, of premises and miles uh, that, that, that you'll be concerned with. One is the total, 
uh, 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 in uh, you know every every, every uh, uh, area, cabled and uncabled, uh, and the other is the uh, unserved and underserved areas. Uh, there are, uh, to the best of my recollection, somewhere in the range of thirty-five thousand uh, uh, total addresses in our uh, service area, uh, but uh, uh, only a, uh, a minority of those are currently uncabled. Uh, it's, it's our goal to, uh, uh, to provide universal service to those uncabled areas. Uh, we will inevitably pass uh, some of the cabled areas when we're getting uh, uh, to, from one uncabled area to another, and we do intend to serve uh, addresses along those routes. Uh, uh, and then there, there is the possibility that even though areas are uh, served uh, 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 now, uh, they're later on after we have completed our work to serve the unserved and underserved, there may be a demand uh, uh, for us to serve currently served areas uh, that we can serve uh, uh, in a uh, economically profitable manner that would subsidize the uh, unserved and underserved areas. So. Uh, you know, our, our order of, of, of operation is unserved and underserved, uh, and then uh, discretion to look at other addresses. But of the 800 miles, will you be doing the full middle mile? Help me with the 800 miles. I still right. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's an estimate. Uh, ba basically, uh, uh, the the starting point estimate for required fiber miles is the number of uh, road miles, uh, and uh, uh, that is an estimate of the road miles in the uncabled areas plus uh, uh, a, a a small amount of. Uh, of Miles in cable areas that we need to uh, that that are the routes between the uncabled areas. So it's the reach all premises in your district that aren't served by cable. It's where you come up with that 800 mile figure. Yes, but not partnering with other cable entities. So the there's no fiber in this area. There's there's no there there is some fiber in this area that. Uh, Actually, it's your, it's your area uh, that D Duncan Cable provides some fiber coverage uh, and some cable coverage in two of the towns. And, and notably, uh, con Consolidated uh, is, uh, is has built fiber in Brattleboro uh, and has, uh, as I think you know, uh, uh, announced uh, plans to uh, build uh, fiber uh, in other cabled areas. And then there is there is fiber through FirstNet, formerly SovereignNet, uh, other fiber that's not available for residents for residential service in that area. Yeah, so there is, that could be middle mile. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we yes, there 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 will be substantial uh, middle mile uh, uh, mileage uh, necessary just to get from here to there. Uh, uh, and to the extent that we can make use of uh, existing assets in a cost-effective way, uh, we certainly uh, aim to do that. And that will be part of the high-level design and engineering process. Uh, you know, without the, uh, the professional uh, help of, of the uh, designers uh, at GWI, uh, we, we would be unable to say just how much of the of our mileage uh, can be sourced from existing uh, sources cost effectively. I have some other you. questions that I would ask David, but I'm mindful that we have other presenters. Yeah. Any other quick questions? Just yes. on the Morgan. immediate next step. Um, I just want to clarify. So you so David, the immediate next step is that you all are waiting. Whoops, now it's gone for uh, for clarification from us on the pre-construction RFP. Yes, uh, we uh, our our hope is to get going uh, on our work uh, as soon as possible, so that we can do the uh, pre-construction work this year to enable the construction work next year. Uh, if we have the if we understand the RFP requirements and process, uh, we will uh, make application just as soon as we can, so we can get going. Last one from me, David. It's Holly Groshner. Um, 
you characterize GWI as your partner. It, uh, what is the scope of that partnership? Is that your design build partner, your system operating partner? What is GWI to your CUD? Right. Uh, uh, we uh, are uh, contracting with GWI uh, to, uh, well, first of all, I should preface it by saying we are going to own our uh, assets. We will be the network owner. We will be uh, the policy decision maker uh, regarding uh, the, constru the construction plans, uh, the pricing, the, the quality, uh, uh, and every uh, uh, service policy. Uh, GWI is our contracted uh, uh, partner to accomplish this on our behalf. And they will uh, be our uh, engineer. Uh, they will uh, be our construction manager. They will be our network operator. And uh, they will be a, uh, a standard offer internet and voice services provider. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Who do we have next? Uh, Jane, would you like to go next from Lemoyo? Are you here? I am here. It's telling me I can't share my screen. I'm changing Is that it? right now. Okay. Okay, you should be able to now. Okay, um, let's go there. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, Sometimes there's a there's a bit of a delay. If not again, I will pull it up. I'm sorry, we're still trying to figure out all this technology here. If I can, if it's easier, oh, here we go. Can you see it now? Oh, uh, no. We just. Yeah. Uh, it says I'm sharing. It says I can stop huh. sharing. Let me. See. Oh, there you go. Perfect. We ready? Yeah, we are ready. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jane Campbell. I'm the chair of Lamoille FiberNet CUD. And as you can see at the top, we now have nine towns. Wilkett has joined our CUD recently. Um, what we've been doing, uh, we've done the feasibility study, high level design, the business plan, business plan review. We co-authored an RFP with NEK Broadband and we're currently in discussions with potential partners. At the same time, we're transitioning to all the systems that we need for management. Um, in the next few months, we assume we will select and negotiate an MOU with a partner or partners. It would be the same sort of setup that David just um, talked about. And of course, we'll do the legal review, financial analysis, et cetera. And that will lead next to the high level design and you know, redo the business plan as needed. Um, once we get the VCBB funding, um, then we'll create the detailed design and we will start you know, working on getting the make ready, the equipment, the construction services, et cetera. Um, the key to our business plan, and this is really important, um, is that we need to go into the areas that are the higher take rate areas. And, and that's relatively speaking, we, we are one of those rural areas that for-profits haven't addressed because of the take rates have been so low. Um, but we need those higher take rate areas, which will give us higher revenues to then be able to fund the network building in the lower take rate areas. Um, and as you can see in the bottom of this screen, our phase one, phase two, phase three, we're assuming we'll build our asset base with grant funds, and then we'll leverage those assets to be able to start borrowing to extend the network, and then we'll eventually go to the bond market to build the rest of the network. Um, the context that we're working in, and this is why that higher take rate, higher revenue area is so important, is that um, as we are every every uh, ever since we started, um, we've been facing um, other organizations, other companies building in our area and taking some of those higher take rate, higher revenue areas. Um, we are talking to um, some of those folks. We've opened conversation channels there. We at the same time, obviously, are having conversations with the the organizations that responded to our RFP. 
And then um, we're very aware that as we're moving forward, we, we all feel this sense of urgency. I think I can say that for all the CUDs, because as we're moving forward, we're very aware that rural areas all over the country have gotten broadband funding and are vying for the exact same partners and specialized personnel and materials. Um, in Rob's email, he kind of posed the question, well, what if we waited? What if we delayed things further to be able to do statewide design or, or something like that? Um, and the assumption that funding will be available has been really key as we're able to talk to these potential partners. Um, it, it helps them know that yes, our CUD will be able to follow through with what we're saying. It's also um, going to impact our ability to develop strategic and operational plans, which is some of our, our work in the next year. Um, and obviously competing for the ne needed materials and labor as the competition goes up, the pricing is going to go up and the supplies will be more and more limited. So that's, um, in a nutshell, um, I am happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. And just one clarifying thing on that, on your slide, you said the pre-construction funding so far will, will get you to construction. You're talking, of, you're not talking about the pre-construction funding from H315, the grants that have already been administered. You're talking about the need for this additional grant funding. Right. Okay, so challenging we have some programs with the same right. The funding that we already, uh, the 315 funding um, will get us to the end of the year, will get us through the MOU process, um, will get us through hiring our, you know, we're this week, we're uh, interviewing finalist candidates for our executive director position, et cetera. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, thank Laura. you. Laura. Uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, with regards to the um, higher take rate uh, areas and the need to hit those first, mm -hmm. can you tell me, are those, uh, are those primarily cabled or do they have fiber or are they really, are, are those higher take rates underserved at this point? These are underserved areas. Um, so we're, we're assuming, yeah, no, no. Uh, some of our district is cabled. Um, in one area, one town in our district, the cable company is stringing fiber, and we have said, let us know how we can help when you get to the edges, you know, if you need help there. Um, the other cabled areas will likely be the last areas that we go to, um, but we're really starting with those high priority areas where it's unserved or underserved. Okay, thank you. Yep. Jane, this is Patty Richards. Thank you for being with us today. Um, one question that I will ask, I am remiss that I did not ask David, and maybe Rob would know this, but did, did you participate in the Erdoff auction? Did you have a no, we did not. We did not. Um, Consolidated uh, is in a lot of our district, and their Erdoff territory is in a lot of our district. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you know, in terms of Deerfield, they also did not end up uh, participating. Okay. Their their partner did not bid for those areas. Uh, some of those areas were won by Consolidated. Okay. Um, some were won by SpaceX. I think the only CUD that participated and in fact was awarded under RDOF was EC Fiber. I think it's well, EC right? Fiber in collaboration with various uh, utilities. So they're. It's both, but we're going to hear from from CB Fiber and uh, NEK, and they both have regions as well. They might be able to provide additional yeah. clarification. And later in the agenda, we have a map that we'll bring up as well. Perfect. Any other questions for Jane? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So, so let's move back to Addison County, uh, Maple Broadband. I believe Steve is presenting. I am here. Let's try if I can share the screen make sure that you have those abilities. I, once again, I apologize. I'm still learning teams here. I believe I gave you that, but let me find out for sure. Yeah. If not, it'll appear momentarily. Uh, I did. So you do have the ability to share. It should be right next to the leave button. Well, let's just see how this goes. Oh, this looks good. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Do we have something? Do we have something there? Success. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm actually quite surprised. 
think that we're going to have, to have you do it again, Rob. Um, my name's Steve. My name's Steve Huffaker. I'm the chair of Maple Broadband. Um, we represent uh, 20 Addison County towns and uh, municipalities, we'll say. Um, and like Jane, we're acting with a sense of urgency uh, to try to work our way through all these pre-construction tasks so we can begin construction. So there's two slides here. This first slide kind of gives you some background um, about how we got to where we are. Um, one item on that first bullet, uh, we, we did spend quite a bit of time on an RFP process and actually had a misstep at one point, but uh, which resulted in kind of a delay in that process. But the one uh, big lesson I think that we learned was that um, we originally were hoping that we could uh, cherry pick, if you will, um, assigning high work network design, high level network design, say to one entity, possibly sole poll surveys to another. And after a kind of thorough interview with our, our bidders, we concluded that that was just going to dilute accountability. So we uh, decided that it was in our best interest to award all the work to one organization. Um, we uh, in June we uh, we approached the our governing board uh, with our, our recommendations and uh, the our board uh, approved our approach, which was to award the pre-construction tasks listed there uh, to one engineering firm and incidentally that engineering firm was also the low bidder um i say here in italics that poll make ready was intentionally excluded from the rfp we did include poll attachment license applications just since, since it seemed like kind of a, a labor grind that we didn't want to deal with at this point and it really wasn't going to impact our going forward uh, steps um we the key here is uh, the next bullet. We applied for $1.3 million to grant pre-construction tasks, but as many of you are aware, 315 just didn't have that kind of money available. So in discussions with Rob, we have uh, scaled back uh, and asked exclusively for $45,000, which was to cover the cost of the high work, high level network design. Okay. I was going to ask if you had questions at this point, but I think we're just going to go to the next one if I can change. There we go. OK. Um, OK. So this is a kind of an aspirational uh, document at this point. There's a lot that we don't know. Uh, we don't know to what degree DCBB is going to want to uh, dictate our, our various steps and how that might impact our schedule. And we also, well, to some degree, I already have a good sense of where the, when funds might be available to fund our next steps. And so this is kind of a caveat at the top of that to, to capture that. Um, it, sometime later this month, we're going to have a network management agreement executed. That agreement will capture both um, maintenance and um, management of our network as well as providing services over our network and uh, under the terms of that agreement we own all the infrastructure that we build and we run the show um, which is our our drive towards ensuring that we do have ultimate access to the uh, municipal bond market next month uh, we're we're also going to receive the high level network design and uh, under under this, I wanted to just make a quick mention. I'm thinking about this approved part, and I'm thinking that based on my discussions with our engineering firm, uh, I, I I believe, and I kind of want to kind of be careful about expressing this properly. But my sense is that that network design, um, we can we can tinker with that design for a while without having it impact the timeline. So my thought is here that um, if, if that may be well well where uh, VCBB wants to have some input on what that design looks like. And I'm thinking that depending on the pace of what VCBB does, that may not interfere with our timeline. In other words, I'm thinking we can run, and I have to validate this a little further, but I'm thinking we can run, continue to proceed, and and then at the side, working with the VCBB to, to uh, to make any necessary adjustments. For example, based on what little I've heard about what you have in mind, it mostly related to um, perhaps uh, augmenting your network, uh, our network to uh, to serve a greater goal. So I'm thinking that kind of thing might be dedicated buffer tubes in some of the infrastructure, uh, which would then be dedicated specifically to 
the state of Vermont requirements rather than Addison County requirements. So I'm thinking we can do those kind of things possibly without uh, facing any delays associated with the work we need to do. Um, we'll be working with our network engineer to identify the build sequence. And this is kind of ties in what Jane had said. I think we're going to be trying to drive towards a higher take rate um, for underserved subscribers. Our big interest at this point is as, to, as rapidly as possible, reach the, uh, the municipal bond market. And uh, we see that, uh, that being achieved once we have uh, several hundred subscribers, three or say two or 300 subscribers, that might be sufficient for us to reach the municipal bond market. So we're, uh, we're gonna use that as, a, as a one criterion for selecting the build sequence. Um, and there's of course other criteria that we need to look at, but the build sequence will kind of drive the next steps that we engage in. So once we know which town or area of our, of our uh, organization is going to be built first. We commission poll surveys to in, in that area, and th then we proceed. After that work is done, we will once the poll surveys are done in that area, we will then engage our engineering firm to uh, begin on the detailed design, construction, bid documents for that area. And so the, the what, one of the other realizations that we came to during the process was that we, I kept thinking about this as a serial process. First, we have to do high level design, then we have to do poll surveys, then we have to do um, detailed network design. And that's that's too broad. What we're what we're doing is we're we're breaking it down into construction zones. And um, as we identify each construction zone, we survey that zone and do construction bid documents for that zone, then move on to the next zone. So in that way, we can keep the process moving. Um, also in September, we're gonna be issuing a business plan, which naturally is gonna follow the details of the network management agreement. Um, October, uh, our big, the big risk factor to us is um, long, long lead time materials. I'm sure all of you have heard all about that. Ships, shortages, OLTs, ONTs, fiber cable. Um, and so we have an opportunity here to uh, take advantage of the fact that our, um, our network manager that we're going to be executing an agreement with has facilities that are capable of taking delivery of long lead time materials that are delivered, say, in, at the end of the first quarter of next year or the sometime in the second quarter of next year so that when we're ready to build, we don't have the absence of materials to delay us. Um, what else did I want to tell you about? I think that uh, in terms of the place where uh, where we stand the most risk as it relates to BCBB activities is funding. Um, as it stands right now, we have sufficient funds to pay the engineering firm to do the high level design um, and we don't have any money to do the poll surveys. And based on what I sense that X71 funds, I don't know when they're going to be available to us, but my, es my estimation is that we will probably want to commission poll surveys sometime, say mid-September, that's four weeks out. So I'm thinking the date's gonna slip. I don't think we can meet that date. I think probably poll surveys aren't gonna be commissioned until October or November, depending on how long the uh, the, the, the grant process uh, slows us down. Um, that's it. That's all I've got. Questions? Thanks for your presentation and love your logo, by the way. Um, are you all planning on um, owning your network? I, I'm yeah. sorry, I missed that. Yes? Okay. Yes, we are. Okay. Thank you. See, this is Patty Richards jumping in quickly. I'm going to ask the same question of everybody. Do you have an RDOF position? No, uh, we, we evaluated that, and there really wasn't much real estate in our region that uh, was impacted by RDOF, and it seemed like even for uh, those areas that are impacted by RDOF, they're probably going to be the last locations that are going to be accessed by RDOF winners. So we may well be able to get access to those areas before the uh, the winners, if that's a choice that we choose to make. Okay, thank you. Holly, you have a question? Yeah, thanks so much, Steve, for, for the presentation. Um, 
Can you give us uh, what your ballpark is on um, addresses that need to be served for universal service? I was afraid you were going to ask that. Uh, no, I can't, I can't give you that. I can tell you that the, the miles are about 500 miles. Um, I was scrambling to try to find a number for you, thinking that you were going to ask, and I do not have it. I can get it but, back. To you. But I, right. I, I, at, at a high level, I can tell you that the the DPS figures are what we've been working against all along. So whatever Rob has furnished and is up on their website is what we use as our basis. And and I have a follow along, if I might. Um, am I right in understanding that you anticipate having a different entity that's your um, design engineering construction group and a diff another entity that is your operating manager? Uh, no. The, the uh, oh wait wait yes it's different excuse me you I, I misinterpreted two different two so, different entities yeah so that so the design and engineering firm is they're they're nothing but telecom engineers that's all they are that's they don't they don't they're not an operator they're not they're not a, a content provider all they do is uh, build or not build design um, network and so the the uh, the operations and maintenance of the infrastructure, as well as providing service over our network, is all all falls to our, our up, upcoming network manager. And, and do you know who that is? I do, and I cannot share because we are days away from executing that agreement. Thank you. Right. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um. How about uh, Jeremy here, CV Fiber? And then our last one will be NEK, unless another CUD wants to participate. All right, let me share this. Hold on a second. Steve, you may have to stop your screen share. Oh, there we go. All right, is that visible to everybody? Yes. Terrific, so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Jeremy Hansen, I'm the chair of CB Fiber. We have 20 towns here in central Vermont, mostly Washington County, but also some adjacent counties too. Um, we have an application from Waterbury, which will be considered this evening. So we may be 21 uh, later today. Um, I'm not gonna read the, the slide to you here, um, I wanna, Make a couple mentions about what um, what we're doing, where we are. Um, we are we have some folks under contract for doing the poll inventories right now. We are waiting for the funding to tell them to get started. Um, we didn't want to have them get started until we had the money in our bank account. And um, for for better, or for worse, mostly for worse, um, there have been some delays, um, some bureaucratic, some otherwise between the, the timing between getting the contracts done and getting the contracts in our accounts, it's a long delay. Um, and we've had these, we've had the contractor ready, contractors, I should say, ready to do this work for quite some time now. Um, so not that that's, not that, you know, fixing the, the uh, finance process at the state is something that I'm going to ask you to, to try to solve. It's, I just want to let you know that that's something that, that really, really impacts our, our timeline. Um, as you're as you're looking at putting grants together um, and the the process for this, I would also request, and this is this get, got mentioned in the little briefing that uh, I sent to you last week. Um, funding should be available in large enough sums so that we're going to be able to keep our contractors going. Uh, the moment that we sort of have to come up and take a breath and dive back down into it, that coming up and taking a breath, uh, we may lose the contractors. We may uh, add unnecessary delays to our our process. So I just want you to be cognizant of that. Um, and then a couple of couple of re requests for you know things that the VCBV could help us with. Um, and this is something that you've that you've heard before, but auditing, GIS, legal. And then looking at really looking at centralized bulk purchasing of fiber. So we all know, all the CUDs know that we will be using fiber. Is it possible to ahead of time go and buy a fair bit of fiber sent at some centralized location? That's that's you all. Um, that then 
the CUDs could come back and purchase from you later. Um, just a thought. Um, talking about statewide design, statewide design should be supplemental to the CUD designs. Um, and maybe looking at how CUDs interconnect, um, any non-CUD areas, how do those folks get involved in that um, network reliability? Um, but we're already planning on interconnecting with our neighboring CUDs. We have active uh, agreements with design with NEK and with EC Fiber. So as we're doing our high level design, it's going to include NEK, CV Fiber, EC Fiber, and Washington Electric Co-op. This is a, a grant that we've applied for through 315 and uh, we will be executing quite soon, as you can see in our, um, in our timeline here. Um, it's really just, just dependent on, again, funding, landing, and our accounts. Um, looking at our costs for detailed design, I just got this number in the last day or two. Um, that cost, for, I'm expecting to be um, about $1.5 million, and that includes the WEC areas. So the detailed design of the of our network along with WEC. Um, so like I said, I'm not I can I can read over the slide or I can explain the the, the chart here. I'm hoping that it's reasonably um, reasonably self-explanatory, but uh, I think I'll just stop there. Or I have two questions. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, large enough uh, grant grant making to allow your contractors to keep working what does that what does that mean um so that it kind of depends at which phase that we're at but um if we're so we, we have our um so whether we're talking about you know construction pre-construction what have you we should have enough that we could be making actual progress um understanding the time of the bureaucratic pipeline yep. such that we start making some actual progress and then we can already be partway through um, that first process while we're securing the funding for whatever the second part is. So I'm, I Jeremy, apologize. I'm, yeah, my apologies. I was unclear on my question. Can you give me a dollar amount? For for which part? Uh, what what size grant? Yeah, what size pre-construction grants would you would you recommend we be looking at? We're going to apply for 1.5 million. Okay. So, and substantially all of that i mean we are not we are not yet in a financial position where we could we have the cash flow to be able to absorb that um and then ask for reimbursement so that or very close to all of that um i i haven't worked out the detailed timeline of what that looks like of what the detailed design looks like or how long um or uh, understanding well how long the bureaucratic process is, but as I as I'm seeing the bureaucratic process, it's it's quite long, months okay. between contract, you know, between RFP and then actually applying for the grant, then getting the grant, and getting the actual grant money in the bank account. It's quite long. And do you have a different amount for construction, or would you still? Um, uh, the, it's it's. Yeah, I mean that, that that's going to depend. Uh, I I don't have that number in front of me. I apologize. Actually, hold on. I I might have it. I just need to look. It's okay. I'm just place. looking for a basis of like some place for us to start. You know, I mean, if, you know, hearing hearing that. The and the other, uh, I guess, is Patty. I've heard a lot of the um, CUDs asking about can we do the central purchasing. I, I would like us to find out if we can. I don't know if we can. You may all know that already. It's That's in the legislation. Well, can but can, oh, we, can we functionally do it? Good question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the cost of storing the material, unless it could be donated, could be challenging based on what I know of other equipment and what is charged by the state to store equipment. But that is <laughs> that's a question for us to put up on the parking lot board. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Christine, you should definitely take a note. Subscribe to a technical set of technical criteria. Yeah. 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 Components and if they don't Fiber's not fiber, right? Yeah. Wire You're is different. not wire. Exactly. Uh, it, it can be if we want it to be, and if we, if we but, want to make that requirement. But right, if CB Fiber doesn't want to build to that standard that we just purchased, then we're stuck with a bunch of reels of fiber. It, and with just, everybody at pre-construction at different phases, how different, would you know how much? Different engineering companies doing it. 
So this is a question. I have, actually, I have a question. I want to. I just I, okay. before we keep going, I just want to make sure I'm going to fully disclose. Anytime CB Fiber or EC Fiber speaks up, WEC is planning to build 860 miles of backbone. We are not planning to be what's called an internet service provider. We are planning to do fiber on our electric system and interconnect and help interconnect CB Fiber and EC Fiber. So WEC's position in this, I just super transparent. Um, that's our role in this. So when uh, Jeremy states working with WEC, that's the connection there. You'll, you, WEC will own the asset. We will and the, own. And the asset will be roadside. It's not middle mile. It is middle mile. WEC's portion is all middle mile. We are not doing anything. Are there any the, others? Yeah, so Belco has a project. It's underway. We are already procuring our materials and we are looking for construction much sooner than any of this. But for full disclosure, we're going to substations and solar uh, and storage generation along these routes. Um, it's not associated with any of this. It's a standalone project. We will partner with anyone that needs access to this middle mile fiber, uh, but um, we're not in this business. So I just want to make sure that's understood. I have a, I have a question uh, for Jeremy. Um, it, phase one says it's going to go to 85% of the unserved and underserved addresses. What's the other 15% going to do? Um, they will get caught up in phase two. And, so this and phase two says it's a build out from the core. And I don't understand what that's meaning. So, so we want in, in the same vein as what the previous CUD said, we have to go to the places that are going to have the highest take rates that are going to give us the firm, the firm financial foundation that we can build upon because the grant money doesn't get us across the finish line. This is going to get us going and we will eventually you know, look at the bond market for um, filling in those gaps. But so we're going to build a, we're going to do the design for everything all at once. The, the high level design and the detailed design, we, we will get that, we will get that done. Well, at least the high level design, we will design the entire network again, in conjunction with, with WEC and NEK and EC Fiber, um, we will build that, we'll design that all at once. And then we're going to actually go to the places where we think we're going to be the most likely to be able to serve people. But then the other 15% tend to be the folks that are quite a bit farther out. And so we will still build there. So we'll build to those places that are farther out and we'll also, it, incidentally for the most part we'll incidentally um, go into the places that are that are served but the our phase one is like let's is let's build the, a good robust network that gets the most bang for the buck and then finish the network later once we have the the vast majority of folks connected thank you jeremy um this is patty uh jumping in can you tell us about your art off position and do you have one so um, we were part of an RDOF consortium. We were not a bidder. Um, so um, Kingdom Fiber Consolidated and EC Fiber all won census blocks within CV Fiber territory. And these, um, and we are aware of these. Uh, I believe there's there, there's less than a thousand premises um, in CV Fiber territory that are covered by these RDOF blocks. I, I don't have that number. Um, on hand right now that I could ask David Healy. He could, he maybe had that number or could run that report, but um, so no, we don't have that specifically. And we have been in uh, discussions with Kingdom Fiber uh, and EC Fiber about how to approach those census blocks within our district. Okay, thank you. David, this is Brian. Um, on your slide, it looks to me in the little graphic at the bottom with area A, B, and C that you're going to break your build into, you know, lack of a better term, construction zones or areas. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so when you go back to Laura's question about grant funding, do you need, do you need the full pre-construction? Do you feel like you need the full pre-construction amount for all zones or is pre-construction for for any given zone enough to keep you going on the ground and not run into delays because of funding gaps? Um, that's that's hard to say. I haven't gotten to that level of granularity, but the detailed engineering here, if I, maybe I'll just zoom in a little bit. The detailed engineering um, is, we're expecting to do that essentially all at the same time. Yep. So 
yeah, that detailed engineering, we're going to be, because we're hiring the same firm to do the detailed, detailed engineering as doing the high level design, we're going to expect to be doing now basically all of that all at once. Okay. And we feel when, that, that, yep, when you get over to construction, that makes perfect sense. I, I agree with that. When you get over to construction where you're going to be um, sequencing this stuff a little differently, I'm just, what I'm trying to get to is, is, you know, the, the larger the grant requirement, the, you know, the more review and consternation it's going to get. If you can break it into bite-sized pieces, that's better. But I totally get your point about not having delays on the ground due to funding gaps. So I'm trying to figure out what the right balance between, you know, if construction zones in phases that, uh, like the construction phase, if con if the construction zone is a is the limit of a f funding asks, oh my God, I can't even get it out now. You know what I'm saying. So yeah. how do we break this down in the most effective way? And our construction zone is a way to do that once you pass pre-construction. Yeah. So I, I think these areas, A, B, and C, this is this is the way that we're approaching it. So as we're building, I mean, when we're expecting that these are going to be on different timelines. Sure. So yeah, so we would be looking for construction money for area A first, followed by B, followed by C. Now, whether we can get to C using all grant money that's to be determined, obviously. Right. So we will move on. Um, we will hopefully be, you know, securing funding for B before we get A done. That's that's my point. Is that these are? It's important right. to have these staggered. That we may not be able to say, okay, here are our final deliverables. Here's the thing that we completed before we then go into the next step. We would need to show that we are making affirmative progress towards the things that we promised for Area A. Um, and you should be able to look at this in a pretty concrete way. I mean, we should be able to take pictures and like tell you how many people are signed up or how many people have service available. And while we are looking then at the next, um, at the next area. So I think that's a, I think that that's a reasonable approach. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. And uh, last up, uh, I believe uh, Evan is presenting for Northeast Kingdom. Hello, everyone. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Evan Carlson. Um, yeah, sorry, introduction. Evan Carlson, AK Bar Broadband Chair. Um, we are a 50 town CUD, uh, are planning to, to get to 55 at some point here. Um, I believe everyone saw this slide or was presented with this slide last week, so I'm just going to kind of leave this here while I talk through um, some of the activities that have taken place as well as pre construction needs. I'll try to be brief since I know we are over. Um, so we completed our business plan in June and this really outlined um, for us how we are going to reach the 33,000 addresses in 2,800 miles uh, of construction uh, to complete the network. Um, we have about 20,000 or 17,000 underserved. Um, this uh, plan also laid out a phased approach for construction. Uh, we are doing uh, essentially four phases um, and are going to be building across uh, areas that include uh, some of the state fiber assets and some of the North Link fiber assets and really trying to leverage those. Uh, we are also a part of the WEC network that uh, Patty and Jeremy touched on earlier, so we are working to that forward. Um, additionally, the business plan included a very clear picture from a financial perspective uh, on how we were going to build this network and highlighted the capacity building needs as well. Um, the other item that we're kind of going through right now, we're finalizing a contract for construction management um, with Mission Broadband who will be driving some of the Concord Waterford project that was funded through CARES uh, last year um, and expecting to uh, light that up later this year. Um, we are selecting a pole survey vendor 
to do, do the poll survey across the municipal electric areas as well as the WEC territory. Um, we are doing a detailed design, uh, hopefully this, this fall, um, and that's going to, uh, did I cut out there for a second? No, no, you're fine. Okay. Yeah, um, detailed design, we're hoping to begin this fall, and that's really going to allow us to kick off construction in uh, spring 2022. Um, and that is certainly where we need funding more than anything else um, when we talk about pre-construction funding. Um, I would say that we also are uh, finalizing um, while well, working through some uh, negotiations with a couple of network operators and um, expect to have one selected, I would say, in the next month or so. Um, and very excited to announce that. Um, so pre-construction needs from a funding perspective, um, we certainly need funding for further capacity building, um, being able to have uh, a, a full-time executive director. We certainly have some funding for that now, but I think being able to continue that support uh, into 2022 is going to be super important. Um, the pre-purchasing of assets for construction in 2022, we know there's a delay in that, and I, that was a comment that I had made in the VCBB meeting last week, but I think that that's something that would be uh, helpful for the, either the state to participate in or to be able to make sure the CUDs have the funding ASAP to be able to do that. Um, we also need to have our funding for the design and engineering, um, and that's going to be a pretty substantial amount of funding for us. Um, and I, I don't know, um, yeah, that's, uh, I know there's some questions on what that looks like from the VCBB's perspective. Um, so we have some thoughts there. Um, the state, um, I think the, the funding needs from the uh, sorry, I'm kind of all over the place here. <laughs> um, the uh, pre-purchasing of fiber, I think, you know, utilizing the state's purchasing power um, will certainly be helpful if that's something that can be done, um, ensuring that the, the CUDs have the assets that they need in advance um, will speed this process up. Um, and if possible, being able to issue an RFP for the, the purchasing of those assets. Um, talking about the design uh, and the role that the VCBB might have, one thing that we feel might work well uh, would be to have the VCBB help with the procurement of backhaul um, and being able to get um, any type of pricing discounts with backhaul providers to the CUDs. Um, and then the potential of a consultant on staff that can help identify where the interconnection points uh, make most the most sense between the districts. Um, and, uh, you know, specifically looking at what the designs that the CUDs are producing and helping determine where higher count fiber should be considered at the, the kind of abutting borders of the districts. Um, that seems like a, a role that the VCBB could play rather than providing a or dictating a kind of middle mile, last mile design um, for each of the CUDs. And I think this was mentioned last week, but it really uh, potentially runs the risk of doubling the amount of work that needs to be done. If the state is producing a design and then each of the operators and CUDs are refining those designs again. Um, before they actually begin construction. Um, obviously, we're trying to move fast, and so doubling the work doesn't seem like it's going to add much value there. Um, the question on RDOF, uh, we have uh, two groups of awardees in our region, um, Kingdom Fiber and Consolidated Communications. Um, the thing that we're looking at doing is offering lit service to those providers across our network. We expect that we will be uh, building probably quicker than some of the providers in the, the areas that were awarded. And that is all I have, so questions? Question Laura. Thanks, Evan. Uh, so I don't know if you heard our discussion earlier about uh, the potential for pre-purchasing 
uh, and the the challenges that arise from. Did, did you hear that discussion? Yeah. So did you have any storage, comments about that? You're saying for storage and for being able the actual logistics of purchasing it. Uh, well, and also I think it was the type, right? So it's not all exactly. exactly the same. So you know, so I think the comment was made. Well, we could. If we were to do something like that, would you all want us to impose like, okay, and you'll be using this type of material? Yeah, I think that there's not going to be any dispute on our end. I think when it comes to the actual fiber itself, there seems like there's going to be enough use between all the CUDs that there's going to be an opportunity to use it. I mean, we talk about fiber counts. I think yeah. if you have a variety of different fiber counts available, and if the state wants to help define maybe what the kind of minimum fiber count should be for backhaul and middle mile, that to me makes sense. Um, and there seems to be a, a role for the BCBB to play there. So, so Patty, I mean, this is, I, I'm really interested in us chasing this down as far as yeah. we can. I don't, and I don't have the knowledge. I mean, yeah. I think some of you will. Well, I think. I've got, I'm compiling a list of this might go into criteria or other areas, but that's one of them. And if the CUDs all agree, yeah, we'll we'll take these four standards, um, then procurement can start. And you know, it might be a six month lead time. Uh, whether or not the BCBB does that or another entity does that, but getting manufacturing space secured, I think, will be the important part. And then we have financial assurances that will have to go. Nobody wants to extend credit to somebody. Right, who's, right. So Understood it's that. complex, but it's you know, on my list. I also did just receive an email from Chris Rushy at EC Fiber and says that they have an ability to potentially do that or at least want to talk about it. Um, so if we're done with uh, NEK, that might be a good transition briefly. I, I, I would just Sorry. ask the CUDs to the extent that you're able to kind of be even more specific together about what you mean when you say that, I think that will help us try and accommodate it. Well, that should go into, for the CDs that are doing, engaging engineering companies to do high level on the detailed design, they would have to be part of that, part of that construct as well. Can I ask a question? If it, would it be helpful for Vicuda potentially to provide yes. a proposal on how, what the kind of fiber purchasing process might look like or kind of what we would uh, appreciate for purchasing? I think that it would very much. I think for all the CUDs, we should ask that. Well, that's VQ. Okay. That's okay. all. I, will, I, will, I, will, I will plan okay. to bring that to VQDA. Um, it really is and, this. That would be great, Evan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Because if we can standardize, we know what we're uh, what we need to purchase and then figure out the details. Yeah, let's see if we can standardize. Yeah, exactly. yeah. to the extent, yeah. right, to the extent yeah. we can. Yeah. Let's, well, um, and, and the fact that some of the organizations have engineering or pre engineering agreements out there already, I don't know what that does. So we haven't heard from EC Fiber yet. If we're are we ready to quickly move to EC Fiber. Chris yes, sitting next to the list. right now. What's yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> I was sure it's chickens or snakes. <laughs> Children or chickens? Yeah. <laughs> Those are chickens. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna apologize. I was gonna apologize for that up front, but um, yeah, that those are chickens and they're loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nothing I can do about that. Um, so, uh, do you all want me to weigh in at this point? I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'm yeah, Chris Rackia, managing director of ValleyNet, which is a design build operate company for EC Fiber. Um, we're actually partnering with GWI as well for uh, for the uh, DV fiber. Um, is anyone from is anyone from EC Fiber on who was planning on doing a presentation on behalf of the CUD? I don't think I I haven't seen that. So so I'm not I'm um, here's what I will here's what I will do. I wanted to talk about the procurement piece uh, briefly because I that's where I have the most. Um, information, but let me let me just say that um, that uh, EC Fiber as an entity, you know, we have over we have 6,200 customers online right now, 
and we're pretty much finishing our build of the original uh, 22 towns. Um, we have Hartford still to do, which includes White River Junction and a bunch of uh, pretty pretty complicated areas. And then we have eight new towns that we're pretty much in the same boat as the other CUDs on in terms of uh, poll collection information, applying for licenses, um, developing those. The other piece that we have, um, which I would share with you in more detail if, if and when you wish the board wishes to get into it, but it's kind of in the lessons learned department. Um, some of our original towns that we built, uh, we kind of built them to people who wanted service and didn't design the whole town at the same time. And some of those are going to need to be rebuilt, frankly. Um, Barnard comes to mind as one that uh, really could stand that, and there are probably a couple of others. So that will go into a lessons learned discussion. But in terms of procurement, um, we anticipated that we were going to have problems, um, particularly with the art off auction um, around the country and all this additional attention to broadband that we're gonna have problems procuring materials. Um, we have ordered all our materials um, for um, both Hartford and most of the new towns already, and we anticipate delivery this fall. Um, but what I wanted to bring your attention to is there is a consortium of uh, <clears throat> groups that are, um, that are able to procure um, through Power Intel and Calix, and I'll talk about those in a second, um, advance ordering where the consortium will store the materials and, and guarantee a delivery when you call them, they will guarantee the delivery within a week. So that may be an option that uh, we can explore some more. Um, we haven't had to use them because we've had such uh, good direct connections with Power Intel and uh, and Calix. What I will say is I think that the um, ARPA funds and and uh, Rob may know this uh, better, but I suspect there's going to be a Buy American um, priority there, and we do try and do that whenever we can. But you know the reality is that even an American company that we buy from like Calix has manufacturing um, that's in China or elsewhere. So I think we have to probably explore that some more. But um, I guess I will I will just stop there and say um, how any questions that I can be helpful with or anything that we can do as ValleyNet to you know help facilitate your work. I'm happy to do that. Laura. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So going back to the grant uh, you're on camera. Uh, going oh, back sorry. to the agreement. Um, so, Thank you. I'll stop smoking. I'll stop smoking my cigar now. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, boy. Oh, God. That's okay. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Thank you. I don't laugh enough. So, yeah, yeah. so going back to the grant, um, the grant sizes that we yes. heard from Jer and Mary, ma making sure that when we're awarding grants, so I know ValleyNet has and EC Fiber have a, a lot of experience in this realm. So when we're thinking about pre-construction and construction grant sizes, do you have an opinion about the sizes of grant awards that we should be thinking about or the range? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think for um, for uh, the poll collection and make ready, um, the the poll collection is about um, is probably about uh, seven hundred a mile. Uh, you know, I expect all these prices to go up because we're all we're all trying to do the work at the same time. But um, we've used we've used uh, um, poll collection at about seven hundred a mile. And um, make ready uh, and design is going to be about ten thousand a mile. Um, overall, construction is, and you didn't ask about construction, but we have that. It, that that's creeping up to about thirty-five thousand a mile. So, when we think about, you know, when you all are coming in, when we have a CUD coming in for a pre-construction grant. You know, what should we be thinking about as 
uh, yeah. the, the minimum that they might need in order to meet Jeremy's Jeremy's question from earlier, right, you know, allow right. us to be able to keep moving. Right. I, su I suggest that um, because of that, that tension between bite-sized pieces as well as you know keeping the continuity going i guess i would suggest that um that the grants um have the ability to um have different sections for you know high level design poll collection um applications for make ready um as kind of separate line items but i do think um you're in you're, you're in the um, million and a half to two million dollar range probably for each of these CUDs. I mean, I hope you all saw the NEK. Uh, it, that is extraordinary, right? The the the, the breadth of NEK um, and the number of miles um, to serve the number of residents in that vast area. I you know. I think from our business planning, we, we've shown that um, that that's going to require some construction assistance beyond the beyond the bonding capacity. But the rest, I think, are similar to, enough to what we've experienced in EC fiber territory that um, that grants to get this going to the point where then there's some capital available. Um, such that you can be attractive to the bond market is 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 kind of the way we we envision everybody kind of going. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, no. I, but I think I think the pre-construction stuff and you know getting to the point where you can start constructing fiber is probably a two million dollar venture for each of these CUDs. I'm just that's a rough that is a very rough estimate. So one point five to two is I think. Yeah, yeah, with any KDM exception, we we kind of estimate. I just did an extrapolation from CB fibers number. You know, if you extrapolate up from the nine point three percent to the state level, we end up with sixteen and a half million. So I suspect with any K's numbers in there, it's probably going to be close to about twenty million total for design. Yeah, design. I think that's probably that's probably about right. I should say we tried to address some of these issues. We're gonna, we're, I know we're running behind schedule, but we do have a draft uh, for review for the board that's still pending with Guidehouse and the state for approval um, of a potential RFP for the remainder of the pre-construction funds. Uh, well, we can talk through, but I know we are running. Okay, any other questions? Um, Chris, just, this is Dan Nelson. Um, yep. What was your design cost per mile, please? Um, we kind of roll it in with the with the um, sorry the chickens are uh, extraordinarily loud at the moment. Um, we kind of roll it in with the uh, make ready application stuff, and we were estimating I would uh, we were estimating about ten thousand total. Thank you. Yep. Chris, quick quick question for you on your um, is it bartered that you have to rebuild? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. what, was, what was what was the flaw there? Well, so it wasn't a flaw per se. It was just the nature of how we started. Remember that we started um, with private um, private equity, um, and what that meant was we were constructing out to people that wanted service and kind of offering service along the way to those that um, happened to be between point A and point B. But the reality is the way to do this right is to design the town all at once, which I'm, I'm not hearing any object, you know, I'm hearing everybody saying they're doing that. But we did not get to, because we were kind of scrapping for funds, we had private equity, private investors who wanted service to their own houses. Um, we had to build kind of a uh, piecemeal. And as a result, the, the overall system in the early days wasn't designed to uh, necessarily have the right number of fibers or an organized way of getting from uh, uh, to everybody. And, you know, we've learned that over time and we've certainly made adjustments and, and have um, more success now. But the reality is in the beginning, we didn't have the money nor the, the penetration to be able to do that. So some of those towns earlier um, really aren't built with um, the right fiber 
numbers or direction um, to to really provide that um, resilient link that we uh, and rings that we look for. So that was really it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of Chris? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. I'm going to insist that we do our break, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. I'm a marathoner. I can just keep that. <laughs> I can make that happen, but I have to make previous arrangements. <laughs> Yeah, why don't we take a 10 minute break? Five. Yeah. At least 10? No more, no more than 10. It's going to be a competition for the bathrooms for the other meetings. We'll be, it's 10 50 now. So please be back at by 11. We're back to, um, we're, we're back to meeting. <laughs> yeah, we're back in session. Yeah, back in session. Thank you. Okay, so we've gone through the CUD updates. Um, is there any comment? Uh, we want to have any follow-up discussion relative to the CUD updates. Can we just confirm that people can hear us? I guess everybody might be muted. You can put up your hand if you can hear yes, us. Yes, we're good. Okay, okay. okay. good. Yeah, it's coming through here. Now. Okay. So that was some very meaty content, very helpful. Any further discussion, questions? Holly. Um, there are a number of references to uh, business models that precede pre-construction or high-level design and um, earlier funding that helped structure a plan. Mm -hmm. a part of our charge is to evaluate, I think, the sustainability of the proposals or the projects that are coming before us. And I just don't know what to do with the random references to, oh yeah, we have a business plan and and how we how we address the evolutionary part of these CUDs. So there's two Matt, absolutely there's two pieces of legislation. So Act 79 comes from two years ago, which is what most of these guys have been operating on and it had requirements to put together a business plan. Yeah. To do that. So I think that's I don't I, know if that's I, the question. No. Okay. In order to to make grant agreements, it seems that we have to also be evaluating the business plan. So, and that is something that I think this group is going to need to figure out. Like, yeah. are we evaluating a business plan before we spend more money? Yeah, do you think is that in the legislation? I, I, I'm not I, recalling that, but so I, I could have just glanced right over it. Here's the way, and I'm going to put this out there because WEC has put forward a business plan. WEC has done a feasibility study, so I'm somewhat operating in two worlds right now. Yeah. And, and our fiber rollout is for electric purposes. Tangentially, it's for the benefit of, of internet service providers. So we have a, a vested interest on the electric side to help us do some things electrically. Of course. Anyway, that said, we've done a feasibility study business plan. That informs us and drives us to move us down the road. I, it could become part of a package that ultimately we file with if we were applying, if we were, WEC is not applying, mm -hmm. but if WEC were lining up to apply for funds from this board, that could be part of the story. But we need to develop discrete criteria, um, grant submission protocols, like here's our 20 pages of fill this out. And part of what, what that, um, Book report or requirement could be is that tell us if you've had a feasibility study. Tell it's tangential um, documents that you would submit as part of our grant requirement. So I look at it as a body of work, not necessarily that that stuff is required of everybody. If that makes sense. Every, everybody's, or at least most of the ones I've heard, are, are they're going to have some sort of pro forma financial projection, right? It's yes. going to have it's going to have exactly. miles. It's going to have numbers. It's going to have take rate. It's going to have some assumptions about retail pricing, and and you know unlike WEC, you know WEC's backstopped by a vibrant electric business. These mm -hmm. these CDs are not. These exactly. CDs right. are not backstopped by anything other than their their pro forma, right? And the reason why I'm concerned about it is yeah. because several times today we've heard, oh well, we want to go out to the bond market, yeah. and we need to establish sustainability, and our plan for that mm -hmm. is to go into high take rate areas. 
Well, it isn't just high take rate areas, it's having a viable business. So, so yep. I, I think, you know, yep. yes, yes to the checklist. Right. But that will be but, part of the body of stuff that is yeah. produced to say, yep. this is why you should give us money. Right. And it isn't yeah. just, did you do it, but rather, what did it yes. say? Right. Yeah. And all the, all the CDs are very far along. Several are holding off on finalizing until they determine with, the, with, the, with their potential partner or operator, since that will influence a lot of what their overall model is. Um, but I, I want one other comment. Another, another reason why I care is because, Krista, could you mute? Um, another reason why I care is because we do have an affordability objective that's underlying all of this. I have an opinion about that. I don't want to bring it up here, but it helps us uh, um, keep that on the checklist. Right. That should be in this body of, you know, grant requirement request. We're going to say. If you want money from the BCBB, you have to fill this out. And part of that is how are you going to fulfill this portion of the low income yeah. requirements? That's what that's what is in my head. Uh, I, same thing. Right. I, I, and maybe Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. Well, uh, something you said is how do we not block them and keep them going because they're on a run? Um, if there was some standardized project schedule, like where are you? This is what it should look like. Your burn rate is, and you need this much capital at these milestones. Mm -hmm. But we can make sure we feed that and yet not give them $3 million today. We feed them appropriately mm -hmm. as it goes. Yeah, I think I, I imagine something that looks like you're approving them for an amount, but you are, but the distribution of the yes. amount will be milestone based that shows yeah. that the ball's rolling in the right direction at the right pace. Yeah. And that as soon as they hit a milestone that says, yep, they're going to make it, then boom, you, you, then you send the next distribution yeah. so that they keep the activity going. Yeah. And, that, and in the, the draft RFP that we're going to view, that's one of the approaches that we took was where we established a cap mm -hmm. and then they would be applying within that cap. Because I've heard with many of the CDs, it's hard to determine, it's hard to get to an operating agreement without knowing right. what you potentially have available to you. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about the process and all of that if we want to go into the into the RFP, the high level, or I don't know. I don't think we should move on to But, but I did cut off Laura when I added to my One quick question. Yes. So I'm, I think I'm aware that there is one CUD feasibility study that came back that it was not feasible. Yes. Is there only one? There is, all, there is, only, there is only one. There is uh, one feasibility study that is still pending and being reviewed. So um, then my question is, is there some comparison of the feasibility studies of all of the feasibility studies to go? I think more to your question. I don't know if such a comparison okay. exists. They, they use a variety of different uh, vendors. Some will be easier to compare compare than than others. So, so for benefit of staff, just to Dan's point, um, the narratives are are great, and it's nice to meet the the CUDs. But I think we need to start benchmarking this out and have a format in which we track where people are and what they're doing. Um, the narratives, we, we're, we're not tracking anything specific. Yeah, this goes to, I sent this in an email, but you know, the concept of a maturity model is basically just you taking disparate organizations and just ranking them on a, on a you know, how mature are they in the evolution to their objective, right? So I'm gonna say this, it's probably wrong, it's just an example, but I would say, if we were to break all the CUDs into like a three-tier maturity model, EC Fiber is going to be at the top. They have they have thousands of customers who pay them regular, who pay their bills regularly. They they know how to design, construct, support, and operate a, a network, a retail network. You know they they're basically just an expansion mode now, but their core business model is proven and repeatable, mm -hmm. right? And they're solvent. You know, on the other side, you've got some some CDs that are you know just starting the journey that EC Fiber started 10 years ago, and so I think we also need to tune our grant process around where do, where does each CD fit in their in the maturity model, because some need more support than others, and that and that we should be in recognition of that, and the monies we award are riskier or less riskier depending upon where they are in their maturity model journey. So I think we need to spend some time doing that. And it's not a judgment on the CDs. It's just yeah. a statement of fact of where they are in their evolution and how that aligns with responsible grant administration. And I would 
and making sure that we bring the tail end up. Sure. Remembering that these are largely community volunteer driven organizations. Mm -hmm. So who needs more help to get yes. to that place? And that, that was the approach with the H3350 funds because it was uh, pre-construction and capacity and various groups uh, needed more in terms of capacity. There was also a long process in terms of ensuring that they have the capacity for grant administration, which is what led us to the idea of the shared discussion uh, reviewing contracts and, and things like that. A lot of those were put into place for those types of uh, safeguards. But I'm sure the CUDs would welcome, and I think they would agree with our assessment of where where everybody is at. I, I, a, a couple caveats on the feasibility studies. Um, one, they were done before the RDOF uh, areas um, mm -hmm. were established. And two, beware of you know saying, I'm aware of the study was said was not feasible. But of course, there's something. NEK is not feasible either without grant funding, you know. Mm -hmm. And so so there were different assumptions made in those feasibility studies. The assumption that NEK was, look, we know it's feasible because we're serving such a such a uh, small area, but how much grant funding do we need? Right. You'll see in the NEK model, you can plug in the grant funding and see what it does mm -hmm. in the time it takes to pay off the loan. So, so that you know, that's why we exist because the feasibility isn't there. And the feasibility, actually, the feasibility studies, probably most of them were done before even the ARPA funds were here either, which yes, is a game right. changer in terms of feasibility. Right. Right? So, I, I think it's a safe bet to say that if they were found feasible before the ARPA funds, they're definitely feasible now. <laughs> right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Molly, did you have something to say? No, no. We can keep trying. All right, we are 10 minutes after 11 and 11 9. Um, shall we jump over to pre construction program? Um, sure, you should all have copies of this. We're just seeing this now. This is just a, as a little bit of background on process. Uh, when when uh, 71 was signed, there the Department of Public Service was given the ability to allocate up to $20 million in funds via the pre-construction program. Uh, we were unable to get an RFP approved. Uh, there was various legal review that went through with the RFP and the state has a whole system for reviewing anything connected to ARPA funds. Uh, we are still waiting for the final go ahead to even be able to release the RFP. Uh, so this document that you have and that we'll put up on the screen uh, momentarily and having a board packet is a draft for discussion. So it's not just us making changes. We may have uh, finance and management coming back requiring various changes as well. So that, that's the history on that. Uh, one other piece of history is H315 <coughs> H provided $1.6 million for pre-construction and capacity. Uh, that has been exhausted and you heard many of the CUDs uh, speak about that all already almost mm -hmm. all of those grants are fully fully executed how much was that 1.6 million uh, you also heard uh, mentions of delays uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to to federal funds and the record keeping and financing there was various mm -hmm. steps in terms of insurance in terms of the federal duns number and sam number all these all these technical things that i will be thankful when i don't have to deal with uh, but it was really getting everyone's ducks in a row to make the process a lot smoother as additional funding goes out the doors. There were some challenges with CUDs where they changed their address or changed their names or various other different things that, that held the process up a little bit. Uh, the grant agreements also underwent a legal review by both the legal staff at the Public Service Department, which delayed those able to, being able to be issued. Uh, but it was all done to get us in a better place to be able to move things out the door, at least in terms of uh, trying to reduce some of that type of bureaucracy and to focus more on the deliberative side of things of what should be approved, what shouldn't be approved, how we go about that. So that's just a, my uh, mea culpa in terms of, uh, the delay, of, of all the delays. Uh, so, th so this was, the first draft of this was probably written in June. <laughs> um, but let me put it up on the screen so everybody at home can see this. And there's just a few things to that we should focus on. Uh, sorry, this may take a moment to find this because. So can I ask a question? Ken? Absolutely. So then as I'm starting to read through this, this looks like it was work done in advance for us. 
that we now are having the opportunity to add out. Because okay. yes. initially we thought this was going to be out before the board was yeah. even created. Sure. Which is great. And so we're not starting from right. complete. So it was changed to being it was changed to being where it's the board issuing it and yeah. various uh, other items in terms of reporting, in terms of everything were switched to being as if this could be used for the board. And this is intended to be a RFP, which is essentially setting the framework for all pre-construction grants. Yes. Which we're not going to be asked to act on today because we're just getting it right now. No, I, that, that's, that's up to the board to, to decide. Okay. And how, of the CUDs, how many of them have already received our past pre-construction? Any of them? Except everybody EC has Fiber. Even EC Fiber has pre-construction needs for their new towns. So everybody, everybody needs... Uh, for the initial $1.6 program, uh, million dollar program, I believe we just, I don't have the exact number, it was close to $9 million in requests. Well oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's it's been, uh, admittedly, it's, uh, the CDs will certainly say it's been a bit of a, of a holdup, but they also understand that the board needs to get stood up and needs to take an interest in this as well. So it's kind of this, this whole balancing act that we keep talking about. Yeah, let me add, add to that. This reconstruction grant doesn't commit the board to anything. This is really to get the money in our account. So ultimately, once this is approved, we get it in our account, we allocate it. Well, using this R, this is the- Using this, is, this RFP. Yeah, 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 yeah but yeah. we can- I don't buy that, yeah. It's, we had to provide a draft RFP to the administration and uh, guide house for a review to make sure that it's in compliance with all the ARPA treasury guidelines. Uh, there can be some changes after that, uh, but it's more of we're, we're, there. There can be back and forth once the initial program is approved, and that gets us access to the the funds that were appropriated. Sorry, can I ask a silly question? What's yeah. Guidehouse? Sorry, Guidehouse are uh, one of the uh, consultants, consultants uh, that yes. review all all appropriations from uh, first from the, uh, the CRF funds, the coronavirus relief funds, and now from the American Rescue Plan uh, to ensure entity? compliance. It's, 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 government, it's, government it's, it's, a, it's consultants that the, the, the administration has. Exactly. No, they're work, it's working for the state. So the state has engaged them. Does Guidehouse have a relationship with all 50 states for this or just Vermont that we um, know of? It's, they work with many different states, but it's certainly not all 50. Uh, there is one of the premier companies that has been reviewing different But just different to reiterate, programs. so they're there to protect us that we've checked all the boxes for the federal funds and we're not going to mess up. Yes. Right. Okay. So that's simple. But sometimes it does take some time. <laughs> Everything. So so that's what, so this is the draft that was shared with them. We they already have it. Change. They already long, have it. And how long have they had it? Oh, in very, <laughs> it's in very, it's, there's been a back and forth over whether they want to approve the $150 million program by program or the entire $150 million appropriation. They've, they've now had uh, this version of the grant for several weeks now. And I believe we uh, we're expecting, hoping <laughs> uh, for some type of approval next, next week. So we couldn't issue this today, even if we wanted to. But we can move towards if we want to make additional changes to this today and start setting over setting up a time frame. We thought it was a good a, a good point to start the discussions at. Okay, so I'm I'm I, let me make sure I follow this because this this is the requirements we're going to attach to the CUDs. This isn't the RFP that we've submitted to the governors. This is part of the package that we had to submit. Okay. But we, as part of that package, we had to submit what we were going to be issuing when we issue our request for proposals, our request for grant applications. So this is the very, very draft version of our request for grant applications from the CUD for the pre-construction program. Can I ask a question? We, we, you submitted a package to the governor's office. You just talked about it. Yes. The, what, what is that? Uh, it's, a, it's a questionnaire for the use of any of the funds. Okay. And we're supposed to attach any RFPs that are in draft form for them to also review so they can get a better understanding of the programs. Okay. It's just like this board is attached to all that stuff and we just don't right. know about it. That's all. Yeah, we, we could provide you copies of that. <laughs> we there's, will there's, provide you copies. Right. Think about it. It's like we're jumping on a train. It's already moving. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and unless yeah, we can see the cars, we can't jump. <laughs> yeah. Some of us will 
be more methodical about how we jump and others just jump. <laughs> <laughs> and that gets to what really I've been working and we should have them yeah. in two weeks. We'll, I really want to have a place where all these documents are kept and you have access to them. That'd be yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're working on it. So we're in talks to figure out the whole website and want to get stuff up there for a variety of reasons sooner than right. That sooner transparency than later, but... is huge. So yes. It's like, okay, if I'm a grant applicant, I want to go to a website and tell me, tell me what to do. What are all the things I have to do? Lay out what exactly what I have to do. And then I go forth and fill out all the, because it's yeah. a, it's yeah. a lift. Filling no, out grants yeah. is a big work project. I, I fully, I fully agree. We just uh, have been not able to release this until we got approval, but we felt that Understood. it was necessary to discuss amongst the board. Absolutely. I'm in a public meeting, so that's why Absolutely. I don't need. Don't send me applications yet, based on what you see in here, please. Right. So <laughs> this is, this is uh, something to poke at and poke holes at, which is helpful. Exactly. Or, so. Well, process-wise, I mean, will will we approve this? I think they, they will approve, I, right? Is that, uh, yeah, so, yeah. is that your expectation not, as the executive? I don't think, not, I, I, we're we not expecting approval that. today. Right. Yes, Eventually, we, will, we yes. will be looking Great. for your approval. Okay. okay. So the next question is, yeah. okay, how, what is the process to go through this? Are you going to do some, just walk us through, or you're expecting us to make we're, changes? No, we're going to give you an overview now. You take okay. it back with you, and you can um, send those recommended changes to me, and i uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll present get, it at the next meeting. Yeah, we'll get a lot of comments up. We'll get a lot yes. Yeah. This yeah. is called yeah. draft one. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And you'll send it Even though it's been so out you can today, track I will send yeah. it in yeah. words so you, can, so you can track edits. This is more just to give you an idea because it's a, a lot of things that you're talking about with pre construction and Excellent. allocating funds and stuff are addressed in here. So I want to make sure that we're, we're on the right track. I feel like okay. we were close, but once again, this was developed before the board was. Exactly. So, yeah. Even so, before X71. No, it's what this. No, no, not before Act 70, 71, um, but it, it was developed right after Act 71 was passed since we were going to have access to, in the interim, we were expecting to have access to a certain amount of funds uh, to get out the door to keep things moving, but that access wasn't provided because of the trying to make sure that we're all on track when it comes to the use of these federal funds, which is a worthy goal for everybody in the state. <laughs> yes. So. Okay, so I'm just going to go through, I'm going to go through some of it fast. Some of it is just a lot of background of what it's funded by. It's funded by Act 71, became law June 8th, all that. Uh, a disclaimer uh, about the American Rescue Plan Act that the Treasury guidelines are still preliminary. Uh, it's very clear in that they are allowed to be used for broadband, especially at the speed, but that disclaimer has to be on there that if additional guidelines come out, it may impact the administration of the program. Good question. So do I have it right that the funds can only be issued to CUDs? Yes. Yeah, for pre-construction. Yes. Just for that step? Just for pre-construction. Yeah. Oh, okay. Construction funds are open to, we can get into that when we talk to right. that, but you'll see when I talk about some percentages, it's, it's based on just for CUDs, which is one of the other reasons why when we we're talking about pre-construction, it was you weren't hearing from the other providers, you were hearing from the CUDs. Uh, so... We set aside uh, thirty thousand dollars was what was thirty million dollars was what was discussed. If, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Laura. Many times that when the legislation was being drafted, uh, when it was put into the budget bill, it was all lumped together as one appropriation. But that so is one is, area that this is a choice. So this is a choice. So this is for the entire program. Pre-construction. Pre-construction program. Is it enough for pre-construction because? Unlike construction, which they can bond for, they can't bond for pre-construction, right? That, that is that is correct. Two yeah, million, two million times nine CUDs. Well, no, it's two. Well, no, not quite. But about twenty. Based on the numbers we had today, we're looking at about twenty million total for design. So then, um, you know, then the, then there'll be make ready costs and on top of that. But I, we think thirty million is enough. Pre-construction include actual make ready costs. I believe in the yeah. definition yeah. that it does. That's it, what, what and, I and, yeah. mm -hmm. We should be explicit about that. We need to yeah. define it. Yeah. Okay, so we need to define yeah. pre-construction more. Okay, I think yeah. Brian's question is an important one, is does it include the make ready cost versus putting that in the construction cost? Yes, yeah, is it the survey cost or is it the actual right. get on the pole and make the room? 
Yeah. That's a good. That's a good. It's a good question. It's something that we should yeah. that we should start explicitly. Yeah. Or is it up to us to define? Yes. So, um, so the first, so the Act seventy one also talks about an equitable distribution of funds under this program, as well as encouraging collaborative work among the CUDs. Uh, and we worked to establish a formula. We tried several different versions of a, of a formula to figure out how to allocate these funds based on the number of towns, number of unserved addresses. We did different variables for including or not including RDOF addresses. It's The results came out very similar because of the amount that we're looking at, but should be, it's, get in there. I'll get to that and we'll talk about this when we go into the numbers. So we talk about other 60, approximately 60,000 locations without access to broadband. Uh, we talk about locations with a plan. So these are lo locations that were either funded uh, via the 2020 connectivity initiative. We only counted wired locations. Uh, RDOF locations that are wired, we did not include SpaceX. Uh, we will discuss later on about whether those should be, how those should be counted because they're not funded at 100%. So but, that's. But they're not part of the definition of universal service in the legislation either. What so they're not to be funded. SpaceX. Yeah, SpaceX ones are not. SpaceX ones are counted towards the numbers for each district. Wait, 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 say that again. So I mean, uh, so what? Let me back up to to determine. I'm gonna actually actually let me scroll down here because this will be what people want to see. I'm I'm gonna give you a pause. <laughs> and say to everybody that under the discussion of pre-construction definition, um, the pre-construction pre grant program is defined in 8085, section 8085. And there's a whole list of things, inc including full data surveys, uh, engineering design and make ready work associated with construction of broadband, um, legal, administrative, consultant, other costs. And there's um, an obligation of the board to make sure the awards are scalable. Okay. 8085, I commend it to you. So as I said, we have, we'll have to discuss how we want to count RDOF addresses. Uh, what I did in terms of determining the un number, the percentage of unserved premises out of the total number of premises in, for all the CUDs. So this isn't statewide, just to be clear, because the, the pre-construction program is only open to communication union districts. So I took the base 2019 data uh, we subtracted the RDOF locations that were funded, the wired RDOF locations that are funded at 100 by 100. By 100. Uh, there's a big asterisk there that many of those were only funded at 20, 30, 40 percent that we will discuss when we talk about the data. I, we deducted the connectivity initiative projects that were funded. Once again, only the wired ones. Uh, we also deducted, there was two supplemental grants to the CUDs to build out in Concord and then Moortown, Roxbury and Northfield, those addresses were subtracted. There was also some charter addresses that didn't make it into the 2019 data uh, that were that were subtracted. So we'll go, we'll walk, I'll walk you through that process again in the, the next section. Uh, but then we took the percentage and that's the percentage broken down by CUD. Of the total after you take out all yes. those other things. Yes. That's what's left of unserved and underserved. Yes. Yeah. So that won't, if I added that up, that's not that's a hundred percent of the remainder, but not a hundred percent of un and underserved. It's a hundred percent of the remaining locations in CUDs. Yeah. So, and as you heard from Jeremy, uh, Waterbury is likely to be accepted today. We have to figure out when we do a cutoff. Um, there's various moving target challenges with this, so that's why I say estimated cap. That cap I figured out based on the $30 million. Um, I tried a variety of different things. The amounts were very, very similar, like within a percentage of breaking it down. I don't understand the you, column, did, estimated amount. So the estimated amount we took, if we have $30 million is applied to the program. Mm -hmm. uh, the percentage of that is what that number is. I got gotcha. you. So it might be a tiny little bit off since the, some of the calculations that we did uh, last night were we're, sli we're slightly different, um, but that's so, and it's also rounded. So it's just straight math on the percent of other numbers. Straight math right. and and some rounding. Right. Okay. So, um, so for example, any K could make an argument that if you're not going to if you're not going to incorporate line miles into this, it's uh, without any sort of weighting. Like it's 
it's not equitable, right? I'm just, I'm yes. just projecting here. Oh yeah, yeah no, there, it's certainly, it's gonna be a challenge and okay. something that's okay. gone back and forth with the CDs of whether there should be various, whether art off locations should be counted but discounted, whether we should have a multiplier for, for density and right. in the back and forth between all the yeah. CDs, what we found is that the numbers are really darn close. And there's so many different variables. Like when you're counting, if you're counting road miles, well, what class roads are you counting? What are you doing about cable there? It's a, it's a, makes it an incredibly complex yes, calculation. Sure, sure. There's already a lot of complexity in here with RDOC locations since uh, the feds didn't use E911 addresses. So they had to be matched. So there's a lot of, it's, uh, we have to accept that there is a margin of error with this. Sure. Uh, the 2019, the 2020 data that the department will come out with won't be out till probably October or later in the year. So for we want to be more specific when we're talking about construction, when it comes to pre-construction, we didn't think that some of those other possible variables were as, as important to consider. Good point. Uh, so it's trying to, we've, we stuff to keep it simple in the end and it's still not very simple. <laughs> um, and have, you, have you gotten feedback from the CDs on this? Oh, uh, we've gone back and forth on a, a lot of it. This is the first time they're seeing this this chart, okay. uh, but there has been discussion, and it's there's we worked with with David Healy at CB Fiber yeah. on this, and they're trying to figure out. Everybody wants to come up with the perfect model, and I think there's a general acceptance that we don't want to make uh, finding the perfect model right. be the enemy of getting this done. Nothing done, because yeah. <laughs> we could talk about this for the next six months and not do anything. Uh, I, there's a, a note included in here about potential, like why we would adjust this. Towns may join or switch CUDs. We already have towns that are shared half and half. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I just divided the numbers half and half for the locations. We could do it point by point, but it, at this point, it seemed like for pre-construction, that's one thing. There might be other time sensitive opportunities. Groups may work together. We may come up with a different one, a different formula, better data might be available. Like there are a lot of things that could change this and these are areas for the, the board to, to make decisions. Um, you, you may have said this, but are there address, unserved or underserved addresses outside of this chart? There are in towns not served by, by CUDs. And the, to, I'm sorry. Uh, Pre-construction fund, funding is only open to towns served by CUDs. And I, I think you said this, but I'm just not clear. Is, can you scale that? Like how big is that number? On a percentage or some, it, we're just. I, we'll we'll get to when we look at the. I have the breakdowns for okay. statewide later okay. later on when we talk about the data numbers. So we, why don't we pause on that? Okay, thank you. Rather than jumping around. Just note on the note section. There's no number two. And there oh. appears to be <laughs> duplication in one. Well, there you go. Towns may join or switch CUDs. Towns may also switch CUDs. <laughs> so. Okay. No, thank you for that. And so like a decision point is like, do we do we update the numbers every town and every time a town joins a CUD or do we set a cutoff? Uh, there's also things that could change this is uh, we know that one CUD is going for an application uh, through NTIA for a broadband construction grant, community broadband construction grant. If they get that and they're entirely served, well, this is gonna shift the formula since those are addresses we no longer need to worry about. Uh, there's also challenges since a lot has been I don't know, a lot is a, put, the, put that in quotes, um, addresses have been served, not just through state programs uh, between the 2019 data and what we have right now. Like you, you've heard from Chris that EC Fiber has built out quite a bit. Uh, we, there's been other projects around the state. So there's, there's a matter of, there's some uncertainty in this. And uh, that's why we did the percentage and what, uh, what light feedback on, it's not, it's not in here yet is, Rather than saying that this is this is a cap, uh, I don't want a CUD requesting their entire cap. Yeah. So maybe setting a limit on what could be requested. There's going to be check points along the way in distributing those funds, but to allow for some of that flexibility as we get more information. But the, so this is a cap. We'll be submitting proposals for specific items. The cap is just to give them an idea of what they have to work with in this. What's available right now to help them in. Their negotiations with partners. All those numbers, I can't do it in my head. Do those all add up to 30 million? They actually, that's one actually, thank you for, for bringing that out. One other thing I did with this in order to keep with this equity thing is I subtracted the grant amounts that we funded via H315. So the percentage is actually out of uh, 31.6 million. Thank you for, for catching that. 
just okay. to make sure because some so the nature of some of the requests like you couldn't if it's a two 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 hundred thousand dollar design project you can't really break that up so it's proved a little challenging so this was to make it that's another subtracted, step. but did you mean you added in we started with 31. i started with 31.6 yeah. million and i subtracted the awards that each cud got and then that's what's left here yes okay great okay so uh Patty, when we're talking about baseline, that's that middle column that we want, right? I mean, is that? Well, that's part of it. Among CUDs, yeah. that's a baseline. Um, uh, the the one thing that I would question is that we're not doing this based on utility plant road miles, and I'm thinking of um, you know the, the overwhelming scope of the NEK broadband project, for example. There are density issues here that are going to be significant, and the definition of pre-construction includes make ready. So I do wonder about whether that has to be factored in. Yeah, I, I like a good point. I'd like to get CD feedback on that before we render judgment. I think it's a really good point. Any case, an outlier, maybe yeah. in our definition, mm -hmm. I think make ready surveying, you know, a little more expensive. If, you're, if make ready actual doing the work on the poles is in there, that's a different deal. Because uh, that's that's bucks. So that definition is going to mean a lot yeah. to this. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is, I want to know, like, so GMP and VEC have put out make ready tariffs to make this affordable to the unserved, right? It's not going to be all these locations, but it's going to be the hardest to reach and the most unserved. And if they need to be taking, they need to be showing us in those applic in the applications what they've learned and what what value they can bring through those channels to supplement this. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. That, that does make sense. And we'll, we have a map of some of those locations that we'll show you in the, the next yeah. section too. So if I can just take that a step further, just yeah. maybe a, a layer of transparency deeper, because it sounded to me like some or one, at least one of the proposals involved maybe a partnership and the make ready costs might be down near zero. So that level of transparency of what the GU is offering and maybe an incumbent might be partnering or who knows. So these are all things we want to know in the grant applications, oh, yeah. yes. And, and we'll get to and that. There's a the whole long thing that, that we want to that, that we'll have to consider as we review them and we're going to want them to tell us about. So and in your matrix, it'll help us weight those favorably. So so let me let me get to like what we're asking for in the proposal. Uh, but let me just say first we we want to still do the 50% the up front and then as expenses and reimbursement, the feds certainly prefer it being all reimbursable, uh, but we recognize that they can't with it as here. So that's what we settled on. That's what we've been doing for, for, the, for the 315 pre-construction funds. Uh, so this is the, was the, the process. So we want to keep the door open. This was another way of encouraging CUDs not to try to estimate all of their costs for the next year and a half and just apply for what they would like to apply for. Uh, so it'd be rolling after whatever the initial deadline uh, has that the executive director or ex executive director and staff or however we want to work this will do the first review of the applications and then the board would vote to approve the applications at the next board meeting would be the goal. We can put other steps in there if we if we want and we as a as an, as an entity, we should determine like how much time you need. So you're not really getting something like before, for instance, <laughs> that's what happens when we have a board meeting four days apart. <laughs> um, so the elements of the proposal, some of this is just the basic stuff that we need for the federal grants. Uh, the narrative is the key. Uh, and this is, this is where like I've had many conversations with the CUDs of that we want someone to be able to read this that doesn't know as much of the backstory to be able to objectively evaluate these proposals. That's something I have struggled with, where it's I have so much communication that I, I know the day to day. I know what is happening there. Uh, but as it was as it was described to me as we were going through the grant agreements and coming up with the grant agreements, this needs to be something that if God forbid it ended up in front of the judge, the judge would understand what was supposed to be done. Uh, so it's to be very clear on that, that we want a lot of background information. Uh, and we can, I, I think that we might want to be very specific and maybe even at, at, at attachments of like attach your, attach your feasibility study, attach your, your business, business plan. plan. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Like things like that, so that you all have all the information that is, that is necessary when reviewing these applications. 
So is the is the are we assuming that when a CUD makes an application that for the pre-construction grant that the scope of their application will cover pre-construction all the pre-construction activities to reach incorporating all the un and underserved locations remaining in their footprint? They should explain that. Okay. As they should as explain that. They, like I said, like yeah, in I phase one, numbers. but different CEDs have it set up in a different ways. So that is going to be a challenge. There also might be circumstances where, okay, they signed an agreement with an operator or build, design build construction uh, for the whole thing and they need to have some certainty. Yeah, I, I just, we so. just need to be really clear about, because the way I think about it, each CED has got a quota. Now, those are the number of locations that need to be reached. They're mm -hmm. the facilitators of making that happen we're making funds available and i want an accounting for how many of those they're going to reach in with this pre-construction work and funding and if there are any that are not in there i just want to know why they're not in there and where are they i'm so glad you said that it's almost like a, you know that's a that's the report card for this the cud yeah is yeah right? it's a numbers game yeah exactly but there are there are also some factors of like you might not there's reasons for and against doing all of your poll collection now versus uh, well, breaking in the part one and part two yeah. and that's their instance. business yeah but i want to know what what we're okay. going to get for what we're finding. well and and another thing to say about that is we should be allocating pre-construction and later and later construction, construction. and later uh, construction funding based on what their oh. service obligations are. In other words, they've got to get those under and unserved addresses addressed. Yeah. So they might not be able to pull down on a grant for the full amount now, but they should be, we should know what their run rate is. We should know what they have left to serve and we should have pre-construction grants available for that. Okay, we're on the same page. Yeah. Okay, sorry, let me just disable it. We, we just can't ever lose track of the math because it's math. That's right. right. And we can't say, oh, you went five million to do it this much, and then six months down the road go, oh, wait a minute, we need to spend it. Right, and we haven't fulfilled. Yeah, it. yeah. my yeah. biggest concern <laughs> overall here, because and it's my experience, is that you, know, you can't get this money back. No. And so um, it has to be really well thought out. And as if there's a lot of questions. Not that you aren't <laughs> thinking it out. You are. I'm just saying it out loud. That's what this does. It maps out, have you thought about this? And it proves yeah. to us, their response will prove to us if they have adequately thought it out. Right. Exactly. And it's like, I want them to think about, okay, the status, the urgency, collaboration. Like, I want them to be thinking about all of these necessary things to ensure that we're, we're building the best and cheapest not cheapest, best. <laughs> Most valuable. Most valuable. Thank you. <laughs> I actually, um, I, I actually don't think that urgency is an appropriate category here because everybody wants service, so all of it's urgent. I think it's it's about what the gating factors are. Like, we need to go to do this by this stage. So, what yes. are the gating issues? That's what I was referring to. And um, well. Uh, and um, it's, it's also very tempting to say that everything should be the cheapest, but I actually have seen that go quite awry. Right. So yeah. let's be careful about that. No, thank you. I think the, the Barnard example is the key thing to remember. So that the cheapest is certainly the wrong word there, but the most valuable and effective, efficient, sustainable, strategic, all, all those other words. All those good words. things, yeah. <laughs> on the maturity of that CUD, yes. where they are, because yes. if we're trying to bring some up and we've got the leaders, they're on track, we might need to spend a little effort. Yeah. And that was one of the other reasons why I wanted to do, to have some kind of formula for a cap to make sure we don't get to a point of where, oh, all the, all the pre-construction money is done and we still haven't managed to lift all boats. Uh, so that was one of the other reasons there. Uh, one thing in here we were trying to figure out how to address is, so with the construction, any overbuild the cable has to be, I don't know if it's incidental was the word, I can't remember what the word was used in the, the legislation, but just asking them to address that question head on, even though this isn't construction, but it, it plays into what's eventually gonna be a construction proposal, uh, demonstration of commitment to universal service. So there's a lot of different things in there. Is there anything missing? I'm gonna spend time with it. You got some set up? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, because I'm not even sure about F. So, uh, I need to think about that. One 
one question I have is, do you feel that all every CUD has the administrative capacity to manage this or access to funding to provide the administrative capacity to provide this? Because that's something I think we have to make sure. Or are, are we, we expecting staff to help? We're going to get to this when we talk about reporting and administration. This is where it's going to come to a, a decision point. I do believe that all the CUDs have the capacity between themselves and the consultants and the work we've already funded to meet this criteria. Um, in terms of the grant administration criteria, that is something that we need to discuss. And I think Christine said it said it great at the last meeting of like what is value added for these groups and what isn't? What can we take a, what can we take off their plate? And centralizing some of the, the grant administration side of things is one model that we're exploring and starting to have some additional conversations with and that we've received very, very well. It's been very well received by the CUDs who would love to be able to focus on their network rather than some of the other stuff that comes with the federal reporting. It would also build in more accountability if we're dealing with one entity that is overseeing the funds in some ways at the other level. And I think part of this is developing, we'll do as a board, we'll develop the key performance indicators that show uh, how effective these funds are being used. So we can have them reporting, the CUDs reporting based on some key performance measures that tie into our goals. Then we can handle the, uh, the, the, the bureaucracy of the grant side. Yeah, and it's like we're having conversation. I think this week with uh, Northern Borders, the Northern Borders Regional Council, a regional commission, and they have an arrangement where for their grants that don't go to state entities, that the local development district, the LDC yeah. or LDD, uh, takes on the grant management side of things that we want to learn a lot more about. And that might be a model where it's at it's at a little bit of arm's length from us, but we also know the reporting is all going to come back in one form, uh, and that there's accountability built in, which could make our lives easier when it comes to our federal federal reporting, uh, build an accountability and take something that is a, all the CEDs will say they never expected to spend this much time on dealing with the, the, this type of stuff. Uh, is there a space where VCUDA um, can help here? Like, should we be funding something yes. there for that consortium? And yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. Because I'm concerned about we pay the, it's like the, we're hen, the fox yes. in the hen house kind of problem, right? Mm -hmm. We so, pay the contractor who's working for them to tell us that they're doing a good job. Yeah. That's the like, Bakuda, like one of the grants we did fund was for Bakuda, Bakuda to hire a program administrator or a, I can't remember how we framed it, uh, but to be able to help with those tasks so that they could be the partner we need them to be for this effort um, and represent all of the CUDs. So this could be an expansion on that since it's a shared goal of everybody. Shifting some of your coordinating work. Maybe. Eliminating some of the overlap and then, and this goes into process flow of like who's doing what and how we move all these pieces together. So. Like potentially we could, this is something we'd have to figure out, but if there is that entity that's established, I mean, I'm going to actually pause that thought because it needs to be thought out a lot more. <laughs> yeah, <I think> we <laughs> it's, but it's an area that we want to look into because it's on the, the next page here. We wanted to know about their financial controls and grant management plan because uh, this has been something that we've been. It's they are volunteer organizations. We're asking a lot of them, um, and we want to be sure that these funds are managed effectively. The reporting is done effectively, and that these groups are are focusing on their communities, not on um, the numbers game and the reporting game. Well, and just much. to put a finer point on it, if we look at this partnership arrangement that a lot of people, what, you know, having served on the board of EC Fiber, it would be natural for ValleyNet to be managing the ad grant administration right. by which they are paid. Right. Too much of a circle. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, and I think we'll have to. I'm not saying that they do that just for the Ethernet. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that that, that it, it, we have to watch for that. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's this is where it comes into like what is the grant management plan, and, and or if we can take that. Yeah, because there is a, like a, there's going to be a single audit required. Um, that's something that could be jointly contracted among all the CEDs to take it off their plate. For instance, there's a, a lot of different things. Um, um, yes, I'm concerned about the time. And making sure that we know when we're going to be meeting again, it feels like there's a lot that we need to 
Okay, we will break at 12 for public comment, not break. Wherever okay. we are in terms of this, we will, that's a time certain 12 o'clock okay. for public comment. We okay. respect that for 12 to 12 15. Then maybe after the public comment, we talk about next okay. steps and next meetings. Okay. But this will go out and electronically. This will go out electronically, and we'll make sure this is all this is all posted as well, so the public can access it now that it's okay. out for discussion. Uh, so, really quickly, activities and budget for each item, uh, detailed project timeline, tasks, milestones. This is something we added for the reporting for 315, but we'd rather them think about it in advance. Uh, included right in there. This is one of the other reasons why they could use support on a list of all the policy requirements that apply to the listing, just the C CFI requirements, not even all the treasury guidelines. Um, you want to get volunteers to run away, so just send them this. <laughs> free money is not free. Exactly. Um, attachments, there's a whole list of assurances. There's a state fiscal recovery, additional assurances that we'll want to have a lawyer look over uh, that just go into some of the other reporting. So. The, uh, reporting requirements. I uh, lined up the reporting to match with all the federal reporting that we have to do and hearing from the CUDs that originally it was the 30th, but they might not get their stuff from their bookkeeper until after the 30th. Uh, so this was just a yeah. uh, contract review. Uh, this is something that we may that we instituted for the 315 where we wanted to make sure each contract had a time frame that had a very clear expectations of, of goals that it was using standards. Uh, it's, we can talk more about that if we, we need to, but it was just another place put there. For this one, I put an interim report and presentation in there. We could also potentially ask them to pre present to us before we approve. Uh, we might have some challenges with figuring out what's confidential and what's what's not. This is where we do need a, we need a general counsel. <laughs> Uh, we can issue a stop work order if things are going off the rails, but through uh, an intense reporting regimen, we are going to know, which is really important. Final report, contract review. So this just stays what I was talking about there, We're following all the wonderful guidelines. And checking the stuff is another role that, whether it's a grant administrator or administrative assistant or whatever, would be a role for, for them to play especially if it's someone that has a, a lot more fine-tuned knowledge of this than I do. Um, the board, and then the, this is the review criteria, and this is where I'm expecting a lot of different input from all of you and hoping for it. So we have strategy and process. Well, how are you gonna do this? Uh, <laughs> like, tell us the whole, tell us the plan. We want to know if that plan aligns with what our understanding is of where the cut is at. Are they being advised by professionals? Like, yeah, these are volunteer groups, but these are all groups that have, for since their inception, have been working with, with consultants that are incredibly knowledgeable about this and have boards that are very well informed. But we want to make sure we can, it's more than checking that box. It's making sure that it is in alignment. Uh, is it going to bring things closer to a, a partnership? Does it pr promote key legislative goals in Act 71? Like there's other things that can be added in here, and this is where I would appreciate even more feedback to, to build this out, because we do need more of a defined process for, for evaluating the applications, especially with this larger pool that we're dealing with, with now. Uh, some of the stuff is very standard. You can make decisions, discussions without further discussion, negotiating, terms and conditions, this is all whatever, I'm not going to go through standard attachment C for the sake of everybody, but I am going to go to uh, one other thing that we want feedback from the board and that we should have our attorney review. These are, this is all stuff we can't change, state fiscal recovery. I'm sorry, I'm get to it. So additional assurances. Uh, this is something else that we would like the, a lawyer to review. This was more asking the CUDs to, to check the box, so to speak. No, that's um, that's not part of what we okay. handed here. Yeah. But that's yeah. not in there. Okay, I'll make sure that the whole thing is posted. We didn't want to, you saw the pages yeah. after, we didn't want to print. Uh, yeah. So it's like part one is a confirmation of financial monitoring controls. This might not be necessary if we do come up with a, if we come up with a system where it's all going through a different entity. Uh, but in the meantime, it might be. 
uniform grant guidelines saying that, okay, if you don't have these skills internally right now, uh, attach and attach all your policies for procurement, all that fun stuff. Uh, if some of the CEDs are working with their regional planning commissions already to handle this, where there would be this expertise when it comes to some grant management, uh, want to make sure that they've looked at the uniform grant guidelines. This was more of just trying to give a roadmap for the groups to, to look at what's involved because there's no such thing as free money and there are a lot of conditions placed on this federal money. Is the uniform grant guideline a state thing or a federal thing? It's a federal thing. It's that, that footnote that I showed you that I said would make volunteers run away. That's that footnote. <laughs> um, and this is all in the Treasury guidelines of what needs to be followed within those uniform guidelines. This has been the story of my summer of trying to understand incredibly complex things uh, that are a challenge. And it's been a challenge to explain them to the CEDs, but it's something that needs to happen and why I I'm all for the idea of taking some of this off of their plate. If that's not obvious. <laughs> um, other conditions, uh, where is it here? That are specific to broadband infrastructure funded with state fiscal recovery funds. This is the ARPA funds. What's required? So it has to do with speeds, has to do with overbuilding, uh, some basic stuff. So that so this is something that we want to work on more and then have a legal a legal review of of this. Uh, this wouldn't this would normally be in the grant agreement, but I wanted it in the RFP so they the groups know what what they're getting into. So that's a lot, and I know we're at time. Uh, but uh, should this be pulled from Guidehouse until the board has input? I I we can still make changes to it. Uh, Guidehouse is trying to approve the entire appropriation to us and a lot of that work has been done done previous as okay. uh, we would just be in communication with them once we have an initial approval if there are large changes that are going to be that are going to be made on this so this this was written to try to check all the boxes of the things that they're looking for and there's a a, a questionnaire process that has to be has to be filled out and it's yeah i get it <laughs> yeah. you you get it look at look at the finance and management website uh, you'll see everything so I just didn't want them to push back that no, no, you can't change this because we've already reviewed it. They, they may suggest some changes that we're going to have to integrate as well. This is one of those areas where it's there's uh, we I don't want to say we're not the final say, but in terms of accessing them, they hold the first strings. So um, it, and it's up to the it's certainly up to the administration of whether they follow exactly what Guidehouse says or provide flexibility. It's all about risk. Like we don't think our, these programs are that risky based on what we've read with the Treasury guidelines and how broadband infrastructure is very explicitly spelled out. But we want to we want to be sure these are these are these are taxpayer dollars. So <laughs> and we only have so many of them. Nobody's going to disagree with you. I hope not. <laughs> so um, well, let me stop sharing. Would you like me to stop sharing the screen at this point? We can discuss and figure out where we're at. I am fine with that. Does anybody? Want to keep it up? Okay, we are good. So our takeaway, our homework is to review this, and the next question will be, when do we need to turn around comments back? And I think that's going to be driven by when the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And time, we could come to an agreement of how soon ahead of the meetings you would, would like the information, and you know we'll, we'll make that discussion after the public comment. We'll set up timelines. So why don't we move to public comment then, and then we'll circle back around and deal with meeting schedules and executive session. Okay. All right. So, so we and we, can, and we are presently not doing the item at 10:15 and haven't addressed the baseline data. Exactly. Well, there meeting. are going to be some holdovers to the next meeting. There's no way we're going to come forward. I think we're going to need to refine our agenda building process a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. If we're going. Right now, it's we're going 100 miles an hour. Yep. So it's not building the plane. <laughs> exactly. We're flying and building at the same time. So are we do the same uh, th uh, three minutes uh, per yes. person, and we'll alternate back and forth. We only have one member of the public here. Uh, so um, I guess last time we started with the people online, maybe this time we'll, we can start with uh, the one person in the room. Steve, you're up. I will let the online people go first. Okay, I'm going to look for hands online or if you. I noted that for quite a while, Steve Huffaker's hand was up while we were having the discussion of CUDs. 
Is Steve still? Yep. Steve, if you're still there? Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, thank you. Thank you for remembering me. Um, the, the, there seems to be, an, what I'm hearing anyhow, is the sense that the that, that BCBB is going to just proceed with the notion of pre-purchasing and warehousing materials. And I would just, uh, I, I wrote this in a letter to Christine a week ago, and I just want to kind of ask that you be careful about that. There's lots of pitfalls. There's lots of reasons that it's going to do nothing but insert delay and diminish accountability. So uh, the I just actually wrote a list. I didn't think I was going to be on the line here, but how do we handle changes in orders? How do we handle overages? How do we handle returns? Um, advanced provisioning. How do you make sure you have enough product when you need it? What happens if if uh, you're you're coming up short and then you're leaving your CUD without product. So um, in general, my recommendation is not to do it and to leave pre-provisioning to the CUD. Now that's certainly counter to the sentiment um, that's been expressed by some of the CUDs, um, and certainly we need to kind of, or I would encourage you to do your diligence. The one thing that had occurred to me that could be of great value would be if it's possible to identify a standard suite of hardware. So you've been talking about a standard suite of uh, strand counts for cables, but what if we all said we're going to go with a standard 10 gig OLT, ONT, and then you negotiate with the manufacturer for reduced pricing, and then we then as the CUDs can take advantage of that as appropriate. So that seems to be less risky than than assuming the responsibility of being a distributor, which is surprisingly complex and riddled with potential challenges, even when a distributor is, even if you were to outsource the work to a distributor. So uh, please be mindful of it. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Steve. So going going back to the room, Mr. Redica? I said I'll wait till your online you. people are done. Okay. okay. Um, next, I think we have David Jones is the next hand that I see. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, doing my best to get my uh, camera going. Uh, in the discussion of the RFP that uh, was just held, uh, I, I believe I saw a provision that uh, uh, only uh, amounts to be spent in the next six months would be uh, 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 should be included in the amounts that, that we would apply for. What we are uh, hoping to do is uh, sign an agreement for uh, engineering and pre-construction tasks, some of which, because we have more than one phase, will extend beyond six months. And in order to sign that contract, we need a funding commitment. We cannot sign a contract if we don't have a commitment for the funds. So I would make the uh, suggestion that although uh, you know the idea of, uh, of gating the funds or, or you know uh, awarding them in stages, uh, you know for for fiscal management, that, that could be a, a, a workable idea. Uh, there should be a larger total that is part of the uh, grant application and for which we can get approval. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on the calls? I don't. Anybody else on the on the call that would like to speak? Okay. I at that point I guess we are back to the the room here. Be a, a little more flexible than the minutes. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, I encourage you as an urgent matter to get your contracted or hired counsel to interpret Act 71 for you, not just rely on alleged counsel's interpretation. I think that there's some real complex areas of accountability that need to be guiding the decisions you're about to make. Uh, 
especially with regards to interoperability, uh, resilience. Um, I do believe Senator Bray phrased it as in the event of failure of a CUD, uh, mergers and acquisitions without losing dial tone, so to speak. Uh, it's important to repeatedly emphasize that the services that you're proposing to fund the building of uh, are going to be voice services and become 911 subject to 911 outage reporting rules. So the resilience imperative is way up to scale beyond anything that I'm hearing from any CUD anywhere. And when I did a public records request to VC Fiber, they had no records whatsoever of their resilience plans. Um, so this is why I'm arguing that the statewide design and engineering is, is crucial because that would give you something to measure the CUD's plans for and actually relieve some of the load from the CUDs. And the analogy I use is you've got, you're awarding 12 different contracts or eight different contracts for puzzle makers and all those puzzles are supposed to fit into a statewide puzzle, but there's no template for what the statewide puzzle is. So uh, I caution and argue that you really should look at the Huntsville model, the St. Louis model, um, talk to the folks who do that kind of work. But I also need to revert back and call your attention to the statutory goals of 202C. There, there's no notwithstanding clause in this bill which means that, and I've spoken to the auditor of accounts about this, You're, this body is still bound by the statutory policies of 202C. And that's where competition, competitive choice for subscribers, open access for competitive providers, and ubiquitous mobile wireless are all statutory goals. And those need to be in, in effect, what you're doing is you're funding the creation of regional telecommunications plan in the absence of a credible or complete state telecom plan. And all those plans have to address competition. And no one wants to talk about it, but it's been a statutory goal for decades. And we can't afford to build a bunch of passive networks that it's impossible to allow a competitor on. Active fiber is not one of the first questions you should pose to your statewide engineering contractor is, does it merit pushing for active fiber where a competitor can serve any particular customer because there's a fiber home run to every building. And just by simply moving an ethernet cable at the central office. Um, so I, I know I'm going to move. Uh, another urgent is to workforce training. Above all else, you need to come up with a plan and seed, seed funding to Vermont Technical College to get these programs started so that you've got some staff to hire or these contractors do next spring. Uh, Consolidated has hired almost all, more than all of the Eustis capacity. And a lot of those folks from Florida and Texas and Louisiana are gonna go fly south for the winter. So we're, we're, that's gonna be a real bottleneck in this. Um, When you're talking about baseline, I guess since I don't get to comment later, the FCC, the infrastructure bill that as of a week ago does reference a new data standard. It's it's still data supplied by the existing. Comcast will have be representing where they're serving uh, 120 is the threshold. And any place they claim to be able to offer 120 is gonna be ineligible for that 100 million that's coming as the small state minimum uh, next year. So we're gonna have two different grant source funds with different requirements, uh, the, the ARPA that we have now and the, the infrastructure bill. Um, also keep in mind that we're, that this is the, the way you're going about it currently is the most inefficient way because we're not addressing cellular we're not addressing public safety grade telecommunications for radio towers, and you would have experience in this with your radio network. The regional public safety agencies need to upgrade their radio communications, and that requires redundant public safety grade fiber to all every tower and transmitter. And that is a, a 
key revenue source for these CUDs if they're to be sustainable. If we turn our backs on that, we're further making the CUDs unsustainable. Also the cable served addresses. Is this the protect cable monopolies strategy or I know that the Act 71 only defines served and unserved as eligible for this funding and for the universal service plans, but the statutory goal is fiber speed to every address in the state by 2024. So if we're gonna to have to go back and piece together another, yet another design, with no, and this body has no responsibility for it, that is the least efficient way to proceed. So Steve, we're at, we're at six minutes. And yeah, probably please, wrap it up. thank you. I'll, I'll, I'm not the chair. being generous. I'm just letting you know where we're at. Uh, the chair will interrupt me when she sees fit. We'll give you one more minute. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for time on your agenda because I can't, you know, I, it's not, efficient to me or you to try to take my insights and decades of study on this topic into three minute slots. Okay. okay, thank you. We also do welcome stuff in writing. We had a lot of, that's what we're asking people just there's a lot to, there's a lot for everybody to process. Exactly. Actually, may I make a comment to that? Absolutely. It would be more likely that we could integrate some of your observations if we received them in writing so that we can check back and refer not just what our notes say, but what you intended that we hear. The second thing I would ask you to consider in your public comments, Mr. Whitaker, is if you could keep them within the scope of Act 71, which, which cell phone and mobility is not, it would help us because it would help us focus on what we need to get done here. If you have if you take issue with Act 71 and its scope, I, I ask you to address that to the legislature. That would help me. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move, let's move along to meeting schedule followed up by executive session. So we have a lot to accomplish um, in a short period of time and we're gonna have to be pushing to, to basically meet these, uh, the rollout of the grants. Um, Rob is out next week. Yes. Good we can catch up. So just to throw this out here, it may be a horrible suggestion. It seems like there's a lot here. Yeah. Um, is there, so meeting in person for decisions, is there an opportunity for us to meet uh, in between in-person meetings just to catch up? Like not for decision making, but just to get briefs. I wonder if that has something to be possible. a public meeting. Yeah, and in the same time, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm just sure. going to throw out that we're all juggling both work schedules and yeah. represent representation on this board, so it is going to be difficult to yeah. to coordinate meetings. I'm just going to put that out. Yeah. You know, we have all got as Rob is doing, juggling a thousand things at once. Yeah. So, but Madam Chair, wouldn't it be true that if um, less than a quorum of us, so that would be um, less than three, mm -hmm. want to meet to talk about issues and ask questions of one another, mm -hmm. that is acceptable, right? To help us get informed and be ready to participate. Because I do think there are times when some of these questions, I have a million questions I could ask you, Laura, about mm -hmm. what did you think about the intent of the legislation in this mm -hmm. regard? and we could get square uh, without taking up the entire board's time. Yeah. Or you can maybe get educated between two people at a time, but we still have to come back around. Absolutely. Not everybody's gonna have that wealth of information. That's right. Yeah, I would make myself available for those. Great, so, great. <laughs> Are we thinking we should meet weekly for the next Couple will, months. Will we get enough done in between and will we drive the staff question. insane? That's a good question. Yeah. I, I, to, to put that out there, we once we get more staff, it'll be a little bit easier to do yeah. this. And that is a, quite the process with the state. Um, so on one hand, I encourage us to, to meet as often as possible, but recognizing that it is intense trying to turn around and get your materials in advance that quickly. <laughs> but I'm thinking, so I'm thinking right now, you've prepared information for us today that we didn't even get to. Yeah. Yeah. So we already have a stack pile, a we, stockpile. We can have a whole nother meeting <laughs> on what we have. Like you don't have to do anything. Oh, we're not staying all day? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
but we could have a whole other meeting just between dealing with the baseline stuff um, and talking just about this RFP document. Those two and staffing, whole meeting right there. That no more further backdrop information I think has to be done. That's my. I'm willing yes. willing to meet. I, I'm the least of your concerns because I have the most flexible schedule. So I'll just say I would be willing to meet to catch up on some of these baseline things for a while. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we're not going to be meeting weekly for four or five years. But you know. I don't think four or five years, but probably a couple of months is my guess. So that yeah, it, for the end of the year. require once a week or at least every other week. Yeah. That's kind of my, my headset at this point. And the more that we can fit in, the better. So next week with Rob out, we, we can use that as a break to catch up because we have plenty to read and review. Um, the week of the 23rd, I'm actually um, at a conference that I have to go to because I'm chairing um, some stuff here at this conference. I'll be back in the state on Thursday and Friday, 26th and 27th. So the only thing I would ask if we move to weekly is just that we try and pick up consistent daytime. Yeah, every every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thursdays are reasonable for me. Tuesdays I have standing meetings. Wednesdays tend not to be great. So Thursdays are I can Thursday mornings would be okay for me. I have okay. to be in Brattleboro at three. Okay. I can do Thursday mornings. I can do I can make Thursday mornings work. I can do 8.30 to noon. Okay. If possible, starting a little bit later because of the daycare challenges, I know we have yeah. that. That would that would be that would be more helpful for me, or I could just participate remotely. Uh, it's it's fine either it's fine either way. Does 8.30 work, or is 9 o'clock better? 9 o'clock would be better. Okay. And what maybe what we plan to do is we go from 9 to 1, bring lunch, bring something so that. We yeah. can make it a, a working lunch right through and we all are self-sufficient. I have another board meeting that starts at 2 on Thursday, so I will be exiting promptly. <laughs> I, I, I'm putting it in for Thursday 9 to 1 for the foreseeable future. Is that what we're doing? So I'm, I'm going to check one thing and if we our meeting location but if we're here i'm going to see if i can book the giga room the much larger room for us <laughs> uh yeah, now definitely. but that's the are, are you sure that we shouldn't meet next week given that we have so much holdover i mean if i need to, if I need, to call, if I need to call in for a little bit i can but i i, I, I think we could do it without you yeah okay. <laughs> we could test your executive director <laughs> Thursday. Thursday. I, I can't meet Thursday. Oh, I thought that was the, the 19th. No, the 19th. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start on the 26th. 26th. Well, again, I'd be glad to meet with individual board members of two at a time. You all just can touch, please. Well, so. Nine to one, we said. Let's yes. find out if. Uh, Giga has to say for at least yeah, the first exactly. meeting. I particularly <laughs> want to pick your brain, Holly, from maybe it's you two together to to know, you know, the, the counter counter some of you to know to know the, the possibilities. Okay. I'm good at brainstorming possibilities. I'm not sure what Well, I just worry, you know, I, I get one interpretation from the department in terms of what the legislation says. I'm curious to get your opinion as well. I mean, you may make a legal opinion too. Yeah. I would not be that. <laughs> yeah. Well, then I think uh, follow up legal opinion. I think there's enough room in a lot of this that it's probably good for us to make a decision about what we'd like to do, what yeah. we think we can do, what we'd like to do, yeah, and then yeah. kind of socialize it. See, then see push back, and if we get pushed back, then we, you know. I agree. Yep. So Giga is booked for the 26th, exactly the time we want to meet. Um, it's more, I'm going to have to try to book far in advance. And is the only these? two rooms is Mega yeah. and Giga? That I, have I, this I, system. Well, I heard hands. yesterday. I will have a change of schedule come yeah. um, October that Thursday morning will not work. This will be good for a while, but I, I can't do it long term once we hit October. Through the Late end. October through the end of the year. 
so we'll be on just, our way by then. Is it booked every week? Uh, it is not. So I'm going to immediately book for the next Thursday. <laughs> and the next one. And, the <laughs> and, next and next just one have it again. as a weekly thing to try and, to do and that. I will, and I will reach out to Wait the until I hear from uh, everybody else. Okay. Well, good what it is. I mean, this. Ask about the state house rooms. Yeah. State house rooms aren't available to non legislative bodies. Hmm. Get that one. I'm going to try to make this repeating. What about uh, going up to National Life? National Life must be require a uh, proof of vaccination. I think that's fine. Um, yeah. No problem. Okay. Yeah. I'll schedule National so Life. So just I just want to put that out there so we don't put this as we will meet forever um, Thursday morning because we will I will have to make a schedule change because I can't do this. So things happening in my future that change. Can we ask for that to be just tagged back in September that we revisit this discussion? And yes. An agenda yeah. item? Yeah. So for now, should I book the book Giga through the 28th or do we want to? And subject to change. October 28th, subject to change. So um, <laughs> I will do that. And Thank you. I accepted for going to get about a thousand emails here, okay. um, but we have to figure out for the, the meeting on the 26th or 27th. Yeah. I'll take care of that. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to go into executive session for personnel? So I'd like. So moved. All right. Second. Second. Okay. It is 1218. We're going to move into executive session. Okay. Um, so let me pause this. Re I'm going to. Um, no. <laughs> so we're not going to see each other next week, but the right. Thursday after that. Okay. Right. Right. okay. I'm going to figure out how to make sure that. Well, I know how to figure out if it's. Unmuted. I'll unmute my computer and everybody will get a wake up call of a really bad sound. Oh, we are unmuted now, officially. Okay, we are Sorry for that, everybody. We are resuming our open meeting schedule. It is 102, and our last uh, point of business is to wrap up and adjourn. I would make a motion to adjourn. In a second. Second. Okay. Opposed? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Meeting adjourned. Yay. I didn't okay. announce. Our next meeting oh. is oh. August 26th. Very close. Are you done? <laughs> we announced it earlier. We did. Yeah, it's just a.